Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Kingdom Keepers 4, Power Play, by Ridley Pearson. Performed by McLeod Andrews. For my daughters, Story and Paige, and my wonderful readers, you make it magical. One. Let's get lost, Finn said to the two girls. Disney Quest was a maze, a place where it was difficult to know where you were. An electronic funhouse filled with virtual rides, video games, and interactive attractions. The enormous building in Walt Disney World's downtown Disney consisted of five floors subdivided into virtual worlds and activities, all interconnected in a way that seemed designed to disorient. Finn actually was currently lost. He couldn't quite figure out where he was or how to get out of there, but his suggestion to get lost stemmed from his spotting Greg Lousy Lewowski at the other end of the gaming room, over near the Guitar Hero consoles. Lewowski was the ninth grade bully, roughly the size of a kitchen appliance. The zit-faced, fingernail-chewing Lewowski had it out for Finn, and Finn knew enough to stay clear of trouble, at least avoidable trouble. Over the past few years, trouble had defined him, had followed him as he and his four friends, now known as the Kingdom Keepers, had gained notoriety for their efforts to save Disney World from the Overtakers, a group of fanatical Disney villain characters within the parks bent on taking over and stealing the magic. Guys like Lewowski didn't appreciate sharing the spotlight with anyone, and at the moment, Finn was roughly a million times more popular than Lewowski. How about the simulators in Cyberspace Mountain? Charlene said. Charlene was to beautiful what Mount Everest was to high. A cheerleader and phenomenal athlete, she was the poster child for the Kingdom Keepers. Her Facebook page had more friends than Ashton Kutcher's. Well, not really, but close enough. Boys liked her, girls liked her, teachers liked her, parents liked her. It was enough to make you hate her. But no one could. She was too ridiculously Charlene to ever have an ill thought aimed at her. Finn considered the suggestion and glanced over to Amanda to get her read. Amanda was a different kind of pretty, mysterious, her looks often changing from slightly Asian to Polynesian or Caribbean. Amanda was not officially one of the five kingdom keepers, but she and her sister, Jess, had unique qualities and unusual abilities that made them important to the team. Amanda and Jess had once been part of a group of foster kids called the Fairleys, as in fairly human. Kids who could bend spoons just by staring at them, or hear clearly at absurd distances, hold their breath underwater for ten minutes at a time, light fires by concentrating, dream the future, see the past. Kids labeled freaks and weirdos. Kids once studied by the military, but dismissed to a special home in Baltimore when scientists failed to duplicate or explain what was termed their controlled phenomena. Currently, Amanda and Jess lived in an Orlando foster home for wayward girls run by the iron-handed Mrs. Nash. Despite sharing not only the same address, but also the same bunk room, they now attended different high schools. Jess had qualified for an AP program and went to Edgewater High along with two of the Kingdom Keepers, Willa and Philby. Amanda had come to Disney Quest this evening because the event was a school-sanctioned function. She'd brought Jess as her one allowed guest. To Finn, it seemed like the entire ninth grade of Winter Park High was there. Finn liked Amanda, which roughly translated to he couldn't stop thinking about her, was often tongue-tied when trying to talk to her, and made a fool out of himself when trying to come off as cool. There was a friction that existed between Amanda and Charlene that he knew had something to do with him, but which he didn't like to think about. In general, he didn't like to think about girls all that much, but he couldn't seem to help himself. Okay, he said. I guess. Finn didn't like roller coasters actually was terrified of them, but wasn't about to admit it. The other three keepers were also in Disney Quest somewhere, as was Jess. Even though only Finn and Amanda attended Winter Park, it had been months since the whole group had done anything fun together. 
their last outing to Disney's Hollywood Studios' Phantasmic, had led to an encounter with the Overtakers that nearly got Finn killed. The idea tonight had been to meet here and stick together, but they'd separated by ride and interest. Philby and Willa had gone to the ground floor to battle pirate ships, while Maybeck and Jess had gone to the bumper cars. Charlene had taken off to the bathroom a few minutes earlier, and Finn had considered ditching her in favor of being alone with Amanda. But it had only been a passing thought, and one he didn't fully understand. He liked Charlene. A lot. But not in the same incomprehensible way he liked Amanda. Luowski spotted Finn and made a face like a football player who'd taken a knee in the wrong place. Finn didn't want to get drawn into that. Come on, let's go he said, as Charlene returned. The three took the stairs to the second floor, and Charlene led them to Cyberspace Mountain. The ride was a virtual roller coaster that allowed visitors to pick pre-existing twists and turns or to design their own. There were five levels of challenge, from easy to terrifying. I'll take mine light, Finn said. Me too, said Amanda. I get sick on roller coasters. We should go together, Finn said, confessing, because I'm basically a chicken. Oh, right, said Charlene. You a chicken? I don't think so. Seriously, the barnstormer is about as tough as I can take. Both girls laughed. Then they exchanged looks that had they been taser shots would have dropped each other to the ground. Bill Nye the science guy tutored Charlene as she scrolled through selections to create a wildly scary roller coaster for herself. Maybe she was trying to make a point to Amanda. Maybe she just loved roller coasters. But it had enough loops and jumps to make an astronaut puke. She used her entrance ticket to store it. Then she quickly worked with Bill Nye to make another very basic ride. She saved it onto Finn's ticket. I love it as scary as it gets, she said, looking directly at Amanda. It's awesome. They headed for the short line of people that waited for the next simulator. Charlene was bumped into by someone, so hard that had she not possessed the grace of a dancer, she would have fallen to the floor. Greg Lewowski. She dropped the two tickets in the process. In a surprisingly polite gesture, Lewowski asked if she was okay and collected the tickets and returned them to her. Finn caught this look in Lewowski's eyes. The jerk liked Charlene. His bumping into her had been no accident. Lay off, Lewowski, Finn said. Amanda took Finn by the arm. Lay off what, Witless? My bad for the knockdown. Can't I help her up? He faced Charlene. I really am sorry. No problem, she said. But Finn was still seething. As in, we don't want any problems. She said this slowly, making sure Finn heard every word. I'll be around, witless. If you want me, you can find me. Try some deodorant, Lewowski. Charlene cupped her mouth, hiding her smile. Lewowski didn't just smell like a jock. He smelled like an entire team that had been working out in the summer heat for five hours. He smelled like a guy who hadn't showered since sixth grade. Or maybe I'll find you, he growled at Finn. I'm not worried, Finn said. I'll smell you coming. The line moved. Finn and the girls were shown up the stairs. The simulators were designed for a maximum of two people. Charlene lined up in front of door one. Finn and Amanda, door three. No holding hands, you two, if you get scared, Charlene called down to them. Finn faked a grin. He was scared already. A cast member wearing a name tag that said Megan accepted Finn's card from him and chose the only pre-designed ride it contained. The door opened, and Finn and Amanda were escorted into the simulator chamber. They climbed down into the padded seats of the red metal capsule. The seats faced a large flat panel screen. Megan directed them to stow anything loose in their pockets. That was when Finn started to worry. She then pointed out the two red stop emergency buttons, one for each rider. Finn's stomach turned. 
He didn't like the idea of taking a ride that needed panic buttons. He pulled down the black padded chest brace as directed. Amanda did the same. Megan double-checked everything. You're good to go, she said. She hit a button, and the simulator's lid closed slowly, locking in place. The only light came from the flat panel display where the ride's parallel track stretched out in front of them. This was a stupid idea, he mumbled. You're telling me, Amanda said. But did you see the course Charlene created for herself? No way I would go on that thing in a million years. She wanted to impress you. That's ridiculous. Trust me, she picked the scariest stuff possible. It would terrify the guy who designed it. But she's going to come out of there and tell us she loved it. He wanted to disagree, but thought she was probably right. The lights dimmed. The ride began. If I scream, Finn said, it's just to make it feel all the more real. She laughed, but not for long. Her amusement was cut short as the roller coaster car began to move forward on the tracks in front of them. A light flashed in their eyes. Sound effects roared from unseen speakers, and the car banked sharply left. Finn clutched the safety harness and shut his eyes. I hate this already, he said. The capsule banked left, did a complete flip in that direction, and then lifted into a double loop, dumping them upside down twice in a row. Amanda's hair fell like a curtain. Finn squinted open his eyes. The track dropped straight down, about a thousand feet. They plummeted down like on the Tower of Terror. Finn screamed a word that would have gotten him grounded for a week if his mother had heard it. It just flew out of him. This is not right, Amanda cried. They reached bottom, leaving Finn's stomach somewhere in his feet. He re-swallowed his dinner. The car shot up like a NASA rocket launch. He screamed the same word again. She tricked us, Amanda hollered. Then she screamed at a pitch so high it should have shattered the flat panel display. Puke alert, Finn gagged out as they entered a triple loop. Please, no, Amanda said. Try shutting your eyes. Only makes it worse, he choked out. Tell me this thing can't actually crash. She released another shriek at a volume that might have been heard in Miami. It can't actually crash, he said, though he wasn't so sure. What if the simulator was put through stuff it wasn't designed to handle, he wondered. What if its bearings froze or its motor overheated? The thing was, even Charlene's ride, as crazy as she'd made it, hadn't seemed this bad. Had she tricked them in order to sabotage Amanda? That was the first time he realized that maybe Charlene wasn't the only one involved. A ride this violent carried the fingerprints of the overtakers. Finn remembered Megan telling him about the panic buttons. He reached down to punch the red emergency stop button. Just as he did, the car lurched left, and he leaned so sharply in that direction that his hand missed the button. Did you see that? He hollered. I think it knew I was trying to stop it. You're losing more than your cookies, Amanda said. So this thing can think? The car dropped again, rose and fell, leaned 90 degrees left and stayed there, jerked totally upside down and did three more upside down loops. Amanda struggled to reach her stop button. But as she did, the track dropped away. She and Finn were thrown forward against their restraints. She punched down and hit the red plastic button. Got it, she yelled. The ride continued. She hit it again. They were flipped over seven times to their right, like rolling down a steep hill in an oil barrel. I swear, I pushed it, she announced. But nothing happened. Impressive, he managed to mutter to himself, despite all the craziness, no longer thinking it was the work of the overtakers, but knowing it, wondering how they might have accomplished such a thing. And what, if anything, Charlene's role had been in it? She had designed the ride, after all. If it was the OTs, 
How had they organized any kind of attack given that their two leaders, Maleficent and Chernobog, were currently locked up somewhere in a Disney holding facility? The Kingdom Keeper's mentor and designer, Wayne Kresge, had believed that, with the head cut off the snake, the body cannot survive. But someone had clearly taken over leadership of the Overtakers. The ride going out of control could not be considered coincidence. The Keepers were under attack. Finn reached down, able to press his stop button. Nothing. It's them, isn't it? Amanda was no dummy. She'd figured it out on her own. Yeah, he said. It's them. By now, Megan knows. He gritted his teeth as the track lifted and fell so hard and so many times in a row that his neck hurt. Something is wrong. She's working to fix it. You're dreaming. Probably. But at this point, she's our only hope. Outside the simulator bay, Megan was in fact hitting every switch and button possible. The system's mechanicals included a warning light display used to alert cast members to potential simulator hardware failure. A single light that ran a solid green, amber, or red. It was currently flashing red. A warning level never seen before, and one that attracted the concern and attention of three other cast members, including the ride manager. It's going to come off the gyros, the manager shouted. Like a wheel coming off a bike. The thing is going to basically explode if we don't stop it. He, too, hit every known control trying to stop the ride. What the heck? He asked Megan, as if it were her fault. The power, she said. Call down and tell them to cut off the power. It's coming apart, Finn yelled. On the screen, the parallel tracks rushed toward them at impossible speeds, reflecting the velocity of their virtual roller coaster car. Finn could barely look at it. Another five loops coming up, then a series of left corkscrews, and what appeared to be the edge of a cliff. Another of the thousand-foot drops. It was no longer the pattern of the animated tracks that frightened him, but the sounds of grinding metal and the way the seats in the simulator were no longer level, but leaning heavily left. It was being made to do things it was not designed to do. Its parts were failing. The bushings, the bearings, servos, and gyros. It was like a car going down the side of a mountain with no steering and two of its wheels loose. It was going to crash. How could they know where we are? Amanda cried out. How is that possible? Finn didn't answer. He knew that when it came to the overtakers, anything was possible. We have to stop it, he said, looking for options. He shoved his back against the seat and tried to slip out of the chest restraint. It was the same kind of restraint used on real roller coasters a padded pipe that pulled down over your head. There was some slack in the way it fit. He got about halfway out before getting stuck. You're going to crush yourself, she said. The simulator spun sideways and rotated forward in full circles seven times. Finn felt his dinner coming up again. Each time he took his eyes off the screen, he felt sick. He tried to focus on the screen the way his father had told him to focus on the horizon when seasick. The nausea passed. He was okay. They fell hundreds of feet face down. Finn squeezed back into his seat, unable to free himself. We have to do something, he said. I'm up for suggestions, she answered. Oddly, Amanda sounded suddenly collected and unaffected by the flips and twirls and drops. She could actually string a sentence together. Then it struck him. Amanda had a unique power. Push it open! Finn shouted over the roar of the simulator's disintegrating parts. Amanda flashed him a look, 
her dark hair hanging fully upside down, her cheeks vibrating like jello. Her eyes strained to find the hatch door that Megan had closed electronically. Neither of them knew exactly what was up or down any longer. It's too strong. I heard it lock, she said. So had he, but what choice did they have? You have to try. If the seal broke, maybe it would initiate an automatic shutdown. Could be dangerous, she said. For me, Amanda was thinking. How would they explain the damage to the simulator? Damage that would come from the inside. So far in her life, her gift, as some called it, had only gotten her in trouble or made her the object of teasing. Subjugated at the age of eight to a foster home for freaks in Baltimore, the Fairleys, she'd been studied by scientists, doctors, and soldiers until she'd had no choice but to run away with Jess. She had no urgent desire to make a scene with her gift and bring all that down on herself again. They jerked violently left, right, front, back, and left again. Finn's head felt as if it was going to come off his neck. Dangerous? he wanted to say. Really? Amanda couldn't risk Finn's getting hurt. She released her bloodless grip on the chest restraint, reaching toward the screen with outstretched arms. Finn watched her close her eyes, bend her elbows, and flatten her hands, palms facing out like a traffic cop's. She pushed up over her head. All at once, and with every ounce of strength she possessed, the metal bulged like it had been hit with a battering ram. Red paint flakes rained down. Sparks flew. Again, he hollered. Too strong, she complained. You're all we've got. The vibrations climbed toward a climax. The push had made the simulator lean even farther to the left. The grinding of metal was now louder than the sound effects. He smelled electrical smoke. They were going to suffocate. Everything you've got, he shouted. The act of pushing drained Amanda. At low levels, she could briefly levitate a person or object, cause them to float for a few seconds. Using up more of herself, she could shove a car a few feet in a parking space or knock a group of people, or overtakers, off their feet. Or... Bend a simulator hatch door. Finn needed her to give it her all. O-M-G! She screamed. On the screen, the track ahead of them rose, fell, and tilted to the right before... disappearing. It looked as if someone had simply erased the track. It broke off in space. Below the brake was a rock canyon so deep that Finn couldn't see the bottom. The simulator shuddered. The smell of an electrical short, like the air before a storm, continued to flood the cabin. Their screams were lost amid the groan and complaint of the failing mechanics. The car reached the end of the track and flew off into space. Amanda thrust her arms toward the overhead door, but this time, like she was lifting an incredibly heavy set of gym weights, going for an Olympic record. Steady, Finn shouted as the car tilted down, now plummeting into the depths of the rock canyon. The hatch door rumbled and bent, bulged and shuddered, the seal cracking open, first a fraction of an inch, then wider, more, Finn said, as the ground, a rock bottom like a dry riverbed, rushed toward them at over 300 miles per hour. The cry of the metal hatch now overpowered any other sound. Amanda's face was scarlet and sweaty, her arm muscles bulging as her bones seemed to bend to breaking. The sheet metal tore at the location of both pneumatic hook locks that secured the hatch. Two inches. Three, the lid blew open. The ride shut down. Smoke coiled from motors and servos. A group of cast members rushed inside, aiming fire extinguishers that belched a yellow foam. 
Finn and Amanda hung against the chest restraints as the simulator rotated forward 90 degrees, facing the ground. It made it hard to see what was going on. Some guy was shouting a bunch of orders. Finn heard Megan say, Are you okay? We're getting you out. Hang on, you're almost out. The chest restraints released without notice. Finn and Amanda fell, crashing into the flat panel display and cracking its safety glass. Finn helped Amanda up, and Megan offered them her hand. They climbed out. Wow, Finn said. That's incredibly lifelike. Amanda played along. Must be expensive if they do that every time. They exited from the smoke and chaos. Charlene stood there, her full attention on their joined hands. Finn hadn't even realized that he and Amanda were holding hands. He let go a little abruptly. Charlene leaned in to examine the twisted wreckage. Smoke and steam and the gas from the fire extinguishers commingled. She fanned it away from her face. What happened in there? She asked. Amanda said, I think next time I'll design my own ride. You don't think I had something to do with that, that... Charlene stammered. With whatever happened in there, do you? You mean just because you talked us into coming here in the first place and you designed our roller coaster? Now, why would I think that? Amanda said. Finn? Charlene pleaded. You gave us the card, Charlie, he said, using a nickname for her only he used. You designed the ride. And Maleficence locked in a jail cell, he felt like adding. Use of her nickname was an attempt at intimacy to remind her that he still considered her a close friend, despite what had happened. But it backfired. Amanda heard him and clearly resented it. Really? Amanda said to him. You're going to sweet talk her after she almost killed us? She stormed off down the exit stairs. Amanda, wait! Finn called after her. I promise you, Charlene said. I didn't do anything. I had nothing to do with this. It wasn't me. They'd been close friends for more than two years. Finn said, Listen, do I want to think you sabotaged the simulator? Come on! But she'd designed the ride, he reminded himself. Finn couldn't let Amanda get away. He hurried out after her. Charlene followed at a run. The building seemed more crowded. He recognized nearly everyone, even though there were 400 kids in his grade. KK rules! He called back to Charlene. His team had long since agreed that when in the parks, no one flew solo. The overtakers took advantage of keepers off on their own. In pairs or teams, their chances for survival increased. Finn shoved his way through the crowd, catching only fleeting glimpses of the back of Amanda's head. She was wasting no time trying to get out of there. She disappeared down the staircase, much too far ahead to hear him calling after her. Charlene closed in from behind him. He glanced over the rail, looking down, hoping to catch a glimpse of Amanda as he reached the bottom of the stairs. His breath caught. Not possible. Snow White's evil queen stood amid a torrent of admirers, all begging for autographs. But the evil queen wasn't looking at her fans. She was locked onto Finn like a laser-guided missile. He jumped back from the rail, out of the way of her gaze. A shudder of terror flooded him. If it was a legitimate cast member, fine. But if it was an overtaker, if it was the real evil queen, then she could throw spells, conjure curses, mix potions to transfigure herself into an ugly old peddler offering a poisoned apple. In short, she was nothing to mess with. Amanda! He yanked his phone out of his pocket and sent a group text. 
possible OTs in DQ. Head to bus ASAP. Hopefully that would get the others moving. Presently, his job was to get Amanda and Charlene out of there. The four other keepers had smartphones just like his, gifts from Wayne and the Imagineers. Amanda and Jess didn't have phones. Even if they'd had the money to buy them, and they didn't, Mrs. Nash didn't allow her girls to have phones. Charlene caught up to him, and he launched himself down the crowded stairwell, fighting through the throng. As he neared the bottom of the stairs, Amanda came into view again. The queen turned to look at Fenn. He averted his eyes, fearing a spell. She walked toward him, the bubble of her admirers moving with her. He stole one more glance in her direction, only to realize she wasn't looking at him, but over his head. He looked behind him. At Charlene. From the step above, Charlene lowered her eyes to Finn and said, What's she doing here? You know who that is? Finn asked, surprised. Of course I know who that is. I've never seen her before. Not the real one. The real one? Is that the real one? What do you think? You feel like giving her the pinch test? Amanda! Charlene cried out loudly. She waved furiously, trying to get Amanda to turn around and join them. But Amanda was too caught up in the reason for her running off in the first place. Even more furious seeing Finn and Charlene on the steps together, she heaved through the crowd, ever closer to the evil queen. I texted the others, he tried telling Charlene. But then he saw what she was up to. She was taking a photo of the queen. Charlene mumbled. What's she doing outside of the parks? Technically, he said, we're on Disney property. He led her down the stairs, fighting his way toward Amanda. Charlene followed. Technically, she said, calling over his shoulder. She belongs in the Magic Kingdom, the afternoon parade, some autographing. Not inside Disney Quest. Maybe it's part of our school event, Finn suggested. He wanted an easy explanation. He wanted to be told this was a cast member, maybe a college student in costume. The queen was slowed by her fans. Amanda had disappeared, hopefully into an elevator or down another stairwell to the ground floor where a variety of rides gave way to a long hallway and an exit that passed through the gift shop. The evil queen seemed caught up in her popularity. A woman pulled in two directions, but favoring admiration over purpose. Finn and the keepers had long since learned that the byproducts of fame, the adoring crowds wanting autographs and souvenirs, the people invading your space away from the parks, was a different but very real challenge. Charlene grabbed Finn's hand. He led her through the crowd, coming incredibly close to the queen. But her fans formed a wall, and they passed by as quickly as they'd arrived. He let go of Charlene's hand and bounded down the less crowded stairway. He ran and caught up to Amanda, turning her by the shoulder. Wait up, he said. She spun around, her face streaked with the snail lines of fallen tears. Let go, she said. I knew it was the OTs. They're here. His eyes refocused toward the entrance of the hallway that led outside. There, he said. Cruella de Vil was looking right at them. Gaunt, pale, and wearing fur in Florida with her trademark cigarette holder in her right hand. She, too, was surrounded by a knot of fans wanting autographs. She raised her cigarette holder and pointed with her long, gloved finger. Look, kids, she said in her creamy voice. It's the Kingdom Keepers. The mass of fans turned toward Finn and Amanda, just as Charlene caught up to them. She's right. It's them. Let's go. Voices echoed off the ceiling and walls. A mass of kids abandoned Cruella and rushed toward them. 
Finn pulled Amanda to him protectively. Amanda said, Oh, no, pointing back toward the stairway. The evil queen. The three of them were sandwiched. Charlene's attention was on the low ceiling decorated with fishing nets and metal sculpture. I can handle this, she said. Stay with me. I have an idea. She broke away from them just before the fans enveloped Finn and Amanda. Finn had learned that the only thing worse than a hyper fan was an angry fan. No matter what, he didn't want to make any of the kids mad or they would harass and glue themselves to him, complaining and shouting and taking an attitude. Hey, how you doing? he said. Amanda looked curiously at Finn, wondering what he was starting. But he knew what he was doing. He'd done it plenty of times before. Offered a pen, he started signing forearms, hands, the back of shirts. The crowd pressed in more tightly, everyone eager to get an autograph. This was what Charlene had immediately understood. Their fans would protect them. Given the distraction, Charlene had scrambled up the wall like a tree frog and was currently hanging upside down from the lights attached to the ceiling. As she moved, so did the human wall surrounding Finn and Amanda. The fans were leaping up and trying to touch her, applauding her, screaming her name. As long as Finn and Amanda stayed below her, the protective wall of fans that encircled them moved with her keeping the evil queen and Cruella at a distance. The two overtakers, they had to be overtakers, were also trying to push through to Finn and Amanda, but it was no use. They weren't going to beat out 50 wild fans. Charlene continued on the ceiling toward the hallway. Finn and Amanda and their fans moved with her. As the group reached the hallway, the room narrowed. Charlene dropped. Finn pushed rudely through that side of kids, dragging Amanda with him. A gloved hand caught his shoulder. Taller than the young fans, the evil queen had reached above their heads and caught him. She said, You cannot stop us. We will do this with or without your help. If you run, you'd better keep running. He ran down the hall at a sprint, twenty of the screaming kids close behind, through the turnstile, the gift shop, and into fresh air. Finn had rarely ever run so hard, and yet both girls were several paces ahead of him and increasing their leads. When a good distance away, he dared to look back. Cruella and the evil queen had made no attempt to run after them. If you run, you'd better keep running. Instead, Cruella was heading to a payphone. She reached it and brought the receiver to her ear. It was the last Finn saw of her, but it struck him as so out of place, so odd, despite the fact that Cruella used telephones in her movies, not payphones, not in downtown Disney. He arrived at the bus stop, out of breath, just as a bus was about to pull away. The driver braked for him and opened the door, and as he climbed on, he saw all six of his friends clustered in the back by the door. Maybeck, a head taller than anyone his age, caught Finn's eye and nodded, clearly relieved to see he'd made it. A telephone, Finn was thinking. Philby contained his surprise when a pop-up window appeared on his lab computer. A bright-eyed 16-year-old with reddish hair and freckles, Philby was a geek in disguise. He looked perfectly normal, but his British upbringing and slight accent, along with having a brain like Einstein, set him apart from other kids. Edgewater High's computer lab security software blocked pop-ups, prevented cookies, and limited web access while simultaneously recording keystrokes. It was like working in the offices of the CIA or the NSA. The lab had five long countertops with chairs and eight laptop stations each. Currently, 31 students all faced forward where their instructor, Mr. Chambers, was stationed to the left of a large interactive whiteboard mounted to the wall behind him. 
The whiteboard could carry anything from a mirror of one of the computers to a PowerPoint presentation or video. The instructor monitored software that showed a real-time thumbnail of each computer screen active in the lab. Mr. Chambers could click on any one of these at any time, seeing exactly what a particular student was doing. Chats were forbidden, as were aimlessly browsing the web, downloads, or entertainment. The pop-up on Philby's screen displayed an invitation to a video chat. Technically, because of the security software and firewall, a pop-up was impossible, which only made it all the more intriguing to him. Despite his computer expertise, Philby had never been able to hack the school's firewall, but not for want of trying. Making matters worse, Philby and his fellow students had all signed ethics contracts, making it their responsibility to report any breaches or misuse of the system. By not raising his hand the moment the pop-up appeared on his screen, Philby had already violated that contract. It didn't escape him that Mr. Chambers could easily be watching his screen, could already know about the pop-up himself. If caught in violation of the contract, Philby would be suspended from lab for a week, possibly expelled from the class for the semester. It called for diversionary tactics, nothing new to Philby and his friends, who had long since established a system to distract Mr. Chambers away from his monitoring software. Philby caught the eye of Hugo Montcliffe, a neighborhood friend with droopy eyes, greasy hair, and shirts that carried unidentifiable food stains. Hugo's father was a hard-drinking former policeman who couldn't hold a job. Hugo occasionally sneaked out at night because he couldn't take the screaming between his parents. Some nights, he'd show up at Philby's house and sleep on the couch. Philby's mom had come to think of him as a kind of adopted son, and Philby considered him the closest thing he'd ever have to a brother. Philby signaled Hugo by tapping the desk twice and then pointing to his screen. Hugo nodded. Philby then turned his attention to Mr. Chambers, knowing Hugo would open a drawing program when he was supposed to be creating a PowerPoint. As Mr. Chambers reached for his computer mouse, suggesting he'd spotted Hugo's divergence from the assignment and would therefore briefly only be monitoring Hugo's activities, Philby made his move. Already wearing a headset for the sake of his own PowerPoint assignment, Philby accepted the invitation to the online video chat. The pop-up window grew in size, and a fuzzy video image appeared. Philby brought his fist to his mouth to muffle his own gasp. Although difficult to see clearly, the white hair and cool blue eyes revealed the identity of the caller. Wayne. The keepers had neither seen nor heard from Wayne in several months not since his hospitalization following the phantasmic adventure. He was believed to be in hiding, keeping himself out of the hands of the overtakers, who would use any means necessary, including torture, to obtain the top-secret location of their captured leaders, Maleficent and Chernabog, or, possibly, to obtain other secret information that the creator of the Kingdom Keepers possessed. Are you secure? The old man's voice was steady but troubled, even as heard over the static-ridden poor connection. Not exactly, but I'm okay for a couple minutes, Philby whispered. Wayne knew more about the behind-the-scenes operations at the parks than any other Disney Imagineer. He had helped to create a new hologram technology, had recruited Finn, Philby, and the others to model for what would become hologram guides in the parks, Daylight Hologram Imaging, or DHI. The new holograms were an instant success. Families could be toured through the parks by a talking teenage guide who was nothing but light, yet looked and sounded absolutely real. Park attendants jumped. Tourists traveled from around the world to see the new Disney phenomenon. But Wayne and his imagineering colleagues had advanced the DHI technology so the five students who'd modeled for them could also cross over into the parks as holograms when they went to sleep at night. Once in the parks, the DHIs could spy for the imagineers or battle the overtakers for control of the parks. A call from Wayne could not be taken lightly. Philby had so many questions he wanted to ask.
How had Wayne managed to breach the school's computer security? Why would he risk contacting Philby in this manner? When had Wayne gotten out of the hospital? Where was he now? Did his call have anything to do with Maleficent or Chernabog? But time was precious. He kept his mouth shut and listened. As you know, these are dangerous times, Wayne said. Dangerous times require risk-taking. My daughter Wanda, whom you've met, has been my eyes and ears of late. She has been extremely busy carrying on my work, our work. But something has happened. She has been jailed by the police. Philby wanted to cry out, but he held his tongue. Wanda arrested? I need Finn to offer bail for her release. This will require an adult, and we know Mrs. Whitman to be... supportive of our cause. Wanda knows things that you five must know, must act upon, quickly. The evil queen, Philby was thinking. Cruella de Vil. It's happening again. Tonight, the five of you must be in Norway's stave church at 8 p.m., not your DHIs, but your real selves. A picture is worth a thousand words. I have so many questions. Prepare for remote access to the server. You may need it, Wayne said. Philby knew this was a call to battle. Since Maleficent and Chernabog were imprisoned by Disney, Wayne's concern suggested that the overtakers had reorganized. But if Wayne was risking breaching the school's computer security, it implied something else as well. You believe they're monitoring our home computers, Philby said, guessing. You see why I contacted you? You understand the bigger picture. Finn is the natural leader, but you, Philby, are the navigator. Steer Finn in the right direction, and he will lead you well. The overtakers were spying on them. It gave him the chills. He'd been IMing with Willa on a regular basis, writing stuff he didn't necessarily want anyone else seeing. Never underestimate their capabilities, Wayne said. We all have learned that lesson too many times. Where are you? Philby blurted out. Are you all right? Wayne looked old and tired. He must be worried sick about Wanda, Philby thought. Unimportant. Do as I say. Do what I ask. Good luck. We're all counting on you. The window went black. The connection lost. Mr. Philby? It was Mr. Chambers from the front of the class. He was not in a charitable mood. Philby slipped off the headset, expecting suspension and possible detention. No videos. You know the assignment. Voice is okay. No video. Philby realized that Mr. Chambers so trusted the school's firewall that he couldn't for a moment believe that anyone had managed to breach it. He must have assumed that the video on Philby's screen was something Philby had created. Sorry, Mr. Chambers. Philby and Hugo met eyes, and Philby thanked him with a quick nod of his head. Hugo smiled and went back to work. He could see the curiosity on Hugo's face. He wanted to know what had required the diversion. Philby would have to invent a pretty convincing story. Hugo was not easily fooled. Philby's heart raced. Wayne, Wanda, the Stave Church. The Overtakers were reorganized, still out there. For the past several months, he and his friends had not worried about such things. They'd actually had lives again. But now, in a few short minutes, all of that had changed. Again. Philby compartmentalized his ideas. His mind worked like a filing cabinet. He held ideas in drawers, opening one or two while closing others. He didn't think about it. It just happened. Once he had hung up from the chat with Wayne, he put all those ideas into a drawer and slid it shut, marking it as urgent. He'd been able to go about his classwork. But now, 
While other kids occupied the time between classes with hallway chit-chat, Philby concentrated on the contents of that mental filing drawer. He made a list of what had to be done and in what order with an emphasis on efficiency. First, he would text Finn about Wanda. Next, he would send a group text to all the keepers about meeting at the Stave Church at 8 p.m. Then, once home, he would take his laptop over to Hugo's house to get off his home network, where the overtakers might be monitoring him. He would access the DHI server remotely and lock it down, making sure there was no chance that the keepers might cross over unexpectedly after going to sleep. Crossing over was not the danger. It was getting stuck as a DHI, failing to come back, what the keepers called the return. Philby spotted Willa up the hallway. In that instant, he became just another ninth grader with a crush. She was standing at her locker, one hand on its metal door, the other at her side while staring into space. He suddenly tensed. His legs felt like lead. He recalled the exact day this change in his attitude toward her had occurred. They'd been sitting at a table at the marble slab with the other keepers when he'd been overcome with a feeling of curiosity. It was something he still didn't understand. But what it amounted to was he wanted to be around her, to know more about her, to spend time with her. She was smart, funny, and thoughtful. Maybe not drop-dead pretty like Charlene, or the brooding kind of beauty like Amanda. Interesting looking, intriguing. More important to him was that they thought the same way, often came to the same conclusions without any kind of communication, like they were connected. Hi there, he said, reaching her locker. You ever know you're looking right at something but can't see it? At the moment, Willow was looking right at him. Yeah, I suppose... My sheet music is in here somewhere. One thing on which they differed. She kept her locker a mess. His was neatly ordered. He studied her locker carefully, reached in, and withdrew the sheet music. Her eyes filled with appreciation. You're awesome, she said. He wanted to hear her say it again. Wayne just video chatted me in the lab, he told her. Yeah, right. I'm not kidding. The locker door slammed into place, and she locked it. Philby could sense both Willa's apprehension as well as her misgivings. He could see her think. She had an intensity that he totally got. But that's not possible, she said. I know. Isn't it cool? It had to be some kind of trick. The school's firewall was breached. Wayne breached it. Spencer Randolph was staring at them from across the hall. A gifted athlete and popular 10th grader, Spencer always seemed to be hanging around Willa. Don't look now, Philby said, trying to make it sound like he didn't care. But Spence can't take his eyes off you. He always does that. Willa blushed. Philby didn't like seeing her blush over Spencer Randolph. She looked back at Philby. Why would he do that? Philby felt confused. Because you're smart? Because you're a Willa kind of pretty? He probably wants to go out with you, he said. Wayne is stupid, she said. Not Spence. I know all about Spence. You do? How had he let that slip? Why would Wayne go to all that trouble just to get a message to you? That's the thing, he whispered. He said it had to be here at the school, that it couldn't be at my home or Finn's or any of ours because he thinks the OTs are monitoring our home computers. What? But we, I mean you and me, Willa stammered. Yeah, I know. We have to stay off our computers and no crossing over. Who knows what they're planning? just when I was starting to feel normal again. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing, he added. Normal if you overlook that when we go to sleep, we wake up in the parks as our holograms. 
We've all been overlooking that for a couple of years now. I don't even think about it, you know? It's just... a part of me, Willa added. We need to tell Amanda and Jess as well. The Keepers had applied the hologram technology to Amanda and Jess months earlier. Philby could remotely cross them over as DHIs as well. But this meant they were now at risk along with the other Keepers. It didn't seem exactly fair. Yeah, they'll need to know. Philby told her about the Stave Church at 8 p.m. He left out the part about Wanda for now. He wanted Finn to deal with that, as Wayne had asked. I'm going to text the others. Not I am. We have to assume that whatever we do online from home could be monitored. That's way creepy, Willa said. Yeah. But what about texting? Probably safer than anything on the internet. I don't see the OTs hacking Verizon. No, that's true. The hallway bell rang, signaling another class for both of them. Spencer had not gone away. The longer he stared, the more Philby felt like kissing Willa right there in the hall for everyone to see. Not that he would ever do it. He shook his head and coughed out disgust at himself. What? she asked. You wouldn't understand. Philby wounded her by saying that. Hadn't meant to. He longed for a rewind button, another chance to say something different. But Willa was already on her way down the hall, her back to him. Spencer peeled himself off the wall and came up alongside of her, and Willa's step seemed a little lighter. Philby stood there watching, sick to his stomach. Two. What are you doing here? Finn blurted out as he climbed atop his BMX bike. It wasn't just any bike, but a trick bike, capable of doing stunts and jumps. Being on the bike gave him a height advantage over Charlene, which he appreciated. You don't have to sound so pleased, she said sarcastically. I didn't mean... It's just that Evan's high. Happens to be playing your school in soccer today, said Charlene. I didn't think soccer had cheerleaders. Am I dressed like a cheerleader? In fact, she wore tight jean shorts and an equally tight t-shirt. Where are you headed? Charlene asked. I'm going to see Wanda. I kind of figured that. Mind if I hitch a ride? The bike was small. Finn had ridden with Amanda before, on the seat behind him while he stayed up on the pedals. But it felt a little weird to offer the same thing to Charlene. I don't bite, she said when he hesitated. No problem, Finn said, glancing around in the mass of kids, hoping Amanda wasn't among them. Finn climbed off, helped Charlene on, and then straddled the bar. He rode away quickly. The message from Philby had injected a sense of panic in him. Wayne, Wanda, the police, he pedaled hard. We're meeting my mom. Only adults can bail someone out of jail, Finn said. And your mom agreed? We'll see. You haven't asked her? Not exactly. He changed subjects. You got Philby's text about tonight? Yes, Charlene said. Do you know what it's about? Only that Wayne told us we had to be there at eight. Why? No idea. What do you think he wants? It's got to be important, Finn answered. Do you know what he told Philby exactly? Why all the questions? Finn asked. Charlene never asked so many questions. She was more of a tell me what to do and I'll do it person. I don't know. Curious, I guess. Am I asking a lot of questions? Yes. Maybe I'm nervous, she said. I talk a lot when I'm nervous. She put her hands on Finn's hips to steady herself on the seat. Now he was nervous, too. He kept glancing back, worried that Amanda would see them despite the fact he was now several blocks from school. We're not supposed to use our computers at home, he said. Yeah, I got that, she said. Hey, 
How come Wayne contacted Philby instead of you? Another question. I don't know. I don't have Computer Lab the way he does. I suppose that could be it. But it bothered him much more than he let on. Wayne referred to him as the leader. Wayne usually contacted him, not Philby. Was his leadership role of the keepers in jeopardy? Had he done something wrong? What do you think it all means? She asked. Wayne contacting Philby. Wanda getting arrested. I thought with Maleficent and Chernabog locked up, this stuff wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't, he said. So? So I guess things never go as planned. Finn's mother was an actual rocket scientist. She'd eventually left NASA to raise Finn and his sister, the dual commitment proving to be too much. But she remained the smartest woman he'd ever met. And the fairest. Whereas his father got angry and upset about Finn's escapades as a kingdom keeper, his mother, a huge fan of everything Disney, supported Wayne's effort to keep the magic alive in the parks. What was to Finn's father a silly ambition fraught with physical danger and risk was to his mother on the level of national importance. Because of this, he had recently opened up to her more, sharing the challenges the keepers faced, sometimes even asking for her help. This was one of those times. Mrs. Whitman, currently a brunette, was thin, happy-faced, and athletic. She hardly wore any makeup. Her shoes were what she called practical, and her earrings artistic. Bailing someone out requires money, she said from the other side of the kitchen counter. Finn and Charlene were both eating bowls of breakfast cereal. I know that. I'm sure Wayne will pay you back. And a bail bondsman. You put up a small amount, and the bail bondsman promises the rest. It's complicated. If the person misses her appearance in court, then the bail bondsman loses his money. And in this case, we would have to repay him. She won't miss anything, Finn said. Please, Mom. It would mean taking money out of our savings. Your father would never approve of such a thing. But if Wayne repays you, it's only gone for a day or two, right? If he repays me, yes. But you've no way to reach him, correct? Finn hung his head shamefully. Yeah. In two weeks, the bank statements will arrive. By that time, we have to have the money back in the account. Does that mean you're going to do it? Finn didn't even try to contain his excitement. Not a word to your father, she said. The sign out front read, City of Orlando, Police Headquarters. It was a normal-looking office high-rise. Finn, Charlene, and Mrs. Whitman checked in at a lobby reception desk and rode the elevator. It was not the dismal, smelly, dimly lit space that Finn anticipated from television, but instead, more a combination of post office and doctor's office. There were some decent chairs to sit in, copies of newspapers and magazines. The overhead lighting was bright, the smell not nearly as bad as he'd expected. A man in uniform sat behind a window of thick glass. He looked pleasant enough. Finn's mother spoke to him for several minutes. She handed him stuff from the bail bondsman, filled out something on a clipboard, showed her driver's license. It reminded Finn of her returning shoes at Nordstrom or paying for an oil change. We can't get her out tonight, Mrs. Whitman reported to Charlene and her son. Some problem with the courts. I can return tomorrow morning, Tuesday at the latest. She has to stay here, Finn said. That's terrible. She's going to make bail, his mother said. It's just delayed a little. But we're allowed to see her. Finn felt a huge weight lift. Yes, he said, fist pumping. You are totally awesome. If Mrs. Whitman could have floated off the floor, she might have. Come on, what are you waiting for? The three had gone through security to enter the building, but they were put through it again before entering the jail. The room they were shown to was plain. 
It looked like a very small version of their school lunchroom with six green plastic picnic tables bolted to the floor. Overhead, tube lighting and lots of acoustic tile. Wanda looked older than Finn remembered. She wore an orange jumpsuit with Orlando City Jail written across the front. Her hair was stringy. She'd been crying. Finn, his mother, and Charlene sat on the bench facing her. A guard stood just outside the door. So how are you? Finn asked. Wanda smirked, her twisted smile telling him more than he wanted to know. Been better, she said. We've posted bail, Mrs. Whitman said. Tomorrow sometime, I'm told. Thank you so much, but I wouldn't count on it. I've been told by the attorney they appointed that they may try for homeland security charges. That's probably why the delay. What did you do? Charlene asked. Wanda lowered her voice. My father has me monitor bandwidth usage on the DHI server, the same way Philby sometimes does. Finn nodded. If bandwidth usage surged, it meant extremely large data packs were moving in and out of the DHI servers. That, in turn, meant someone was crossing over or returning. Wayne watched for unusual or unexpected bandwidth usage as a warning sign of possible overtaker interference. Wanda said, There has been some unusual activity. Data surges late, late at night. A spike at one point from the Animal Kingdom server. Others as well. We knew something was going on, we just didn't know what. So I hacked one of Disney's multi-protocol routers. If the internet is the information superhighway, I hacked a major intersection, a truck stop. That's probably why the Homeland Security charges. It's kind of like hacking Google or Microsoft. But you work for Disney, Finn said. That just makes matters worse. I look like a disgruntled employee. Oh, my, said Mrs. Whitman. I came away with more questions than answers. What seemed to be happening couldn't possibly be happening. I needed more data, more time to drill deeper. That was when I was arrested, in the middle of all that. It was only then I realized that I'd probably been set up. That I'd walked into a trap. She looked each of them in the eye, making sure they understood the earnestness of what she was about to tell them. Our friends, she said, meaning the overtakers, who weren't their friends at all knew that if they made enough noise on the DHI servers, it would attract our interest. Mine, Philby's, someone's. They could then alert the authorities who would follow the data mining back to its source and arrest whoever was messing around. In this case, me. That would then mean that I'd need to be bailed out. And who would bail me out? Wayne, Finn answered. Wait a second. Are you saying it was all a way to make Wayne show himself? To draw him out, Wanda said, nodding. That's my guess. A father's first instinct is to save his children. My dad nearly came here. If he had, he'd never have made it through the doors. They'd have had him out front, I'm sure of it. So he contacted Philby in order to not come here in person, Finn said. I made him promise not to come, Wanda said. Was the internet stuff you turned up for real? Charlene asked. We won't know without more tests, she answered. More investigation. Do you know where your father is? Charlene asked. More questions, Finn thought. He said, That's none of our business. It is if the police are going to torture her or something, Charlene said. Don't be ridiculous, Charlene, Mrs. Whitman said. That kind of thing only happens in movies. Wanda and Finn exchanged a questioning look. We've got to get you out of here, Mrs. Whitman said. As the bus from the transportation center rolled into Epcot, Finn spotted a pair of crash test dummies, 
CTDs, on segways patrolling the parking lot and pointed them out to Jess. Moving her dark hair off her face to get a better view, Jess's features reflected off the bus window. She had a teardrop chin with full lips and wide-set eyes. She changed her hair color, which had turned horsetail white after an encounter with Maleficent, several times a year. She pointed out the segways to Amanda. The overhead monorail line divided the enormous parking lots. The lane beneath it was used for the parking lot shuttles and as a pedestrian walkway leading to the park's front gates. A fun distraction for park visitors, the CTDs on segways were known to the keepers as possible soldiers for the overtakers. Some were nothing more than cast members in CTD suits acting out a part, but others were robotic drones armed with high-tech detection and surveillance equipment outfitted with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Originally, these had been introduced to Epcot by security, an effective and inexpensive way to patrol the parks during regular hours and after closing. Their popularity had led to the cast member variety, CTDs that would talk and interact with the visitors. But somewhere along the line, the overtakers had managed to electronically hijack control of at least a half dozen of the robotic variety. Seeing them now so close put Finn on guard. Well, if they're looking for you, they'll never spot you, Amanda said. Not with you looking like that, they won't, said Jess. Finn wore an Orlando Magic jersey with a heavy chain around his neck, a Yankee cap sideways on his head, and mirrored sunglasses. His shorts went below his knees, and he wore basketball shoes with Nike socks. There were probably a few hundred boys just like him in the park at this very minute. You look so stupid, Amanda said, prompting a laugh from her and Jess. Good, Finn said. It was true. He looked like an idiot, but that was the point. If he happened to be recognized in the park as a kingdom keeper, he'd be hounded for autographs. If he was hounded for autographs, he'd win the attention of security. If security caught him or any of the keepers in the park without approval, his family could lose their golden Mickey pass. Or worse, operations management could bring the hammer down. It was one thing to attend a school function in downtown Disney, but something else entirely to be in Epcot without asking permission. Operations management did not want park visitors seeing both the DHI hologram guides and the real-life models for the DHIs in the same park at the same time. Finn and the four others were under contract not to visit any of the parks without prior approval, approval they currently lacked. Plus, you're hanging out with two gorgeous girls, said Jess, striking a pose. So we know who everyone will be looking at. Jess was typically more modest than this. The comment from her drew a shrill laugh from Amanda. They seemed to be having more fun than he was. We need to keep our eyes on them, Finn warned. Seriously. Okay, we get it, Amanda said. He'd ruined the moment. He wanted to kick himself. Entering Epcot, they passed beneath Spaceship Earth, which looked like an elevated giant golf ball, reaching the Fountain Plaza, where a computer-controlled water show ran. It could mesmerize visitors for hours at a time. Pavilions rose on both sides, the land, the seas with Nemo and friends, test track. Beyond the plaza was the 15-acre lake surrounded by the World Showcase pavilions, each representing a different country and duplicating its most famous architecture, the Eiffel Tower in France, a Mayan temple in Mexico. The Autumn Food and Wine Festival was underway. Special booths offered food and drink. The mood was even more festive than usual. The place was packed. At a few minutes before 8 p.m., the sun set. The Illuminations Reflections of Earth show would take over the lake and the entire park before long. There was a buzz in the air. For Finn, the buzz felt more like fear. Seeing Wanda locked up had upset him. The idea that the overtakers had tried to trick Wayne out into the open worried him. They were planning again. They were up to something. With Wayne in hiding and Wanda in jail, it fell onto him and the keepers to figure out what was going on and to stop whatever was planned. 
The only timetable was right now. Finn, Amanda, and Jess arrived at Norway's Stave Church just behind Philby and Willa. The steeple on the dark brown wooden church rose 40 feet in the air, while the interior space was quite small, a closeted, museum-like space. The walls were dark wood, the ceiling vaulted. The five displays depicted various scenes, or famous people from Norway's colorful history. There were descriptive plaques alongside each. The three girls drew together in the far corner and immediately began talking the way girls do. Finn and Philby were left alone. Philby reviewed everything he could recall about the video from Wayne. Finn detailed the visit with Wanda. A trick? Philby asked. That's what she thinks. Makes sense. Yes, it does, Finn agreed. I wish she'd told you more about the data bursts. I knew you were going to say that, Finn said. You are so predictable. It's what I do, Philby said, unapologetically. What could it mean? Philby shrugged. All sorts of things. But it's kind of random that she'd hack a bank of Disney routers. That's like hacking the streetlights at an intersection. No wonder she's in trouble. He mulled it over. What's interesting, I suppose, is why she'd bother in the first place. Those big routers. I suppose if you wanted to determine where the packets were headed, the firewall logs might be all you'd need. Finn lost him for a minute while Philby was doing the math in his head. Listen, there's one other thing before she gets here, Finn said. Charlene, Philby said, naming the only girl not there yet. Yeah. I know this doesn't make any sense, but she designed our ride. She gave us the card. Do you know what you're saying? Yes, of course I do. And look, was it her alone? No. But that's even more disturbing. And today, she just materialized at school. Said she'd ridden over with the Evans soccer team. She's been asking all these crazy questions. This is Charlene we're talking about. I know, Finn said. That's what got me. Since when does she ask a dozen questions in a row? Since never. But she did today. She was like Sherlock Holmes or something. You can't accuse her. Not without evidence. It isn't fair. We just don't do that. I know, Finn said. I get that, but I wanted you to know. Only you. So I should keep an eye on Charlene? That's all I'm saying, yeah, Finn added reluctantly. Not that I like it. No, it's ugly. Speaking of ugly, he told Philby about his seeing Cruella de Vil on the phone outside Disney Quest and how out of place it seemed. This is beginning to feel like a parallel universe, Philby said. Right, Finn said. Philby reached out and touched Finn's shoulder. Just making sure we're not holograms, he said. Both boys laughed. A father and son entered. The son was carrying a Kim Possible cell phone. The Kim Possible quest was an interactive mystery hunt where the participant joined a popular cartoon character's pursuit of bad guys. The phones gave clues and could lead you all over the park. The boy searched the church and apparently found the answer in a display description that his father helped him to read. The boy squealed and pushed a button on the device. The phone gave him his next location. The two left without having paid any attention to the five kids. Maybeck arrived out of breath. He looked around the small area, making sure they were alone. He said hello, and then, Did any of you see the CTDs out there? There was a pair trying to follow me. I lost them, but they were zoned in on me. Appraising Maybeck, Finn said, not the best disguise I've seen. Maybeck liked the fan attention, loved it was more accurate, and rarely changed his appearance. He wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be mobbed. I'm kind of hard to miss, he said. You reap what you sow, Willa told him. Where's Charlene? Amanda asked, looking past him. 
Philby and Finn exchanged a curious look. Maybeck said, She stopped to get us some food. I'm starving. It's eight o'clock, Philby said. So what? I can't be hungry at eight o'clock? I'm hungry all the time. I have a big appetite. I wouldn't mind something, Jess said. That dinner tonight, she said to Amanda. Mrs. Nash's tamale pie is basically microwaved dog food with boxed gravy and Doritos on top, agreed Amanda. Gross, Willa said. You should be in the same room with it, said Amanda. Maybeck said, I don't think we should hang here too long. Not only are there cameras all over this park, right, Philby? But I wouldn't be surprised if those CTDs circle back and come looking for me. We'd actually be safer out there with the mob lining up for the fireworks. I love the fireworks, Amanda said. Willa said, So why are we here anyway? What's going on? Do we even know why Wayne wanted us here? Not yet we don't, Finn answered. What we know is that the OTs are active again. He told them about the jail visit with Wanda. Philby tried to explain what Wanda might have been doing hacking the servers. Disney has an elaborate set of firewalls in place. Think of it as one of those European foot walls around all of Disney World's data lines, one you can't climb, one with gates too strong to bust through. On cue, the door banged open. Charlene entered, struggling to balance a stack of small plastic plates, all holding food. Everyone hurried over to help her. Shortly thereafter, lips were smacking loudly. So, Finn said to Philby, you were saying? The point is, the firewalls log any events, that is, attempts to breach them. There are subnet masks, ISP numbers, all sorts of data that can be traced and used to track down where the attack came from and who was behind it. If I'm Wanda, that's what I'm looking for the person behind the data bursts. And if you're the OTs? Charlene asked. If I'm the OTs and I'm attacking firewalls, Philby said, then I'm either looking for a way in or a way out. A way in would give me access to other Disney data, like the location of where Disney might lock up certain other overtakers, Maybach proposed. Like that, yes. Or you remember how we used the changes in temperature inside pavilions to try to track Maleficent? That kind of record would tell them everything they want to know. Energy use, Willa said. Philby smiled. He loved the way her mind worked. Absolutely. Disney has to keep Maleficent cold. They're not going to mistreat her, and she needs cold to survive. That would require more energy. That's a number. Something easy enough to uncover. Those kind of records could be hacked. They're going to bust Maleficent and Chernobog out, Maybeck said, speculating. It's a jailbreak. Silence. Philby began nodding. Nicely done, Terry. Could it be? Charlene asked. It makes total sense, Willa said. They're trying to gather enough data to locate where Maleficent and Chernobog are being held. At the same time, they know that's going to attract our attention. Wayne, Philby, Wanda, someone. When that happens, they have a backup plan to lure Wayne out into the open and kidnap him. Maybe they want information from him. Maybe they want to trade him for Maleficent and Chernobog. But it's all directed at the same goal. Freeing the boss, Maybeck said. And with Wayne in hiding and Wanda out of the way, Willa said. It's up to us, said Finn, prompting another heavy silence. The church door pushed open. A girl and her parents entered. They were also on the Kim Possible quest. The keepers scattered, pretending to be interested in the various displays. The mother and father looked on as the girl read a plaque, looking for the same clue the boy had earlier. Her father complimented her as she identified the king in question. Check the A box, he said. I know, Dad, the girl complained, a little snotty. Are you going to let me do it or not? He stepped back and the girl worked the phone. Then she stopped and looked across the room. 
her curious eyes finally settling on Finn. She tentatively crossed toward him, her father keeping an eye on her. I've played this game like six times, she said, addressing Finn shyly, her parents now nearby. But this is the coolest yet. She handed Finn the Kim Possible phone. He accepted it reluctantly. She hung her head slightly, embarrassed. I recognized all but those two, she said, pointing to Amanda and Jess, when we came in. Her parents looked around, not having a clue who the kids were. I didn't want to bug you. I, we, all of us appreciate that, Finn said. Is this a friend of yours, dear? The mother asked skeptically. Oh, Mom, come on! These are the Kingdom Keepers, you know? This is like the most awesome Kim Possible ever! Philby said, We're not actually part of... Ow! Finn had elbowed him. The girl pointed to the phone in Finn's hand. Read it. Finn read the message on the phone's small screen. Hand your phone to the nearest Kingdom Keeper. Press OK to continue. Finn reread the message twice. Wayne's reach inside the parks never failed to amaze him. Maybeck came over and read the screen. What if when you push OK, it sends our location to our other friends? I kind of need my phone back, the girl said. Finn pushed OK. The screen changed. Go to the KP cart in Norway. Tell them you're my friend. W. Press OK to continue. Finn pressed OK. Hand the phone back to the guest. Press OK to continue. Finn pushed OK and returned the girl's phone to her. Before leaving, she asked everyone to sign her Epcot map. Bounding with excitement, she left with her parents. When they were alone again, Finn said, We have to trust it. This is why we're here. It could just as easily be a trap, Maybeck warned. Wayne gave us all phones, he reminded. If he wanted to contact us, wouldn't he just call us or text us? Am I missing something? Why bother with the Kim Possible thing? Charlene said, We won't know until we try. Willa said, He is always paranoid about the OT's eavesdropping. When he puts us on a quest, it's to tell us something that no one else could figure out. I volunteer, Charlene said, raising her hand. I'll do it. Amanda and I could do it, Jess said. We aren't kingdom keepers. We wouldn't raise any suspicions. She's right, Philby said. And if it's a trap, Finn said, then they catch the wrong people, and who knows what that means. Charlene said, I thought you were the one trusting it. Busted. I said, I volunteer, Charlene reminded. I'll go with you, Finn said. But if they catch you, we can't let them catch you, Amanda said. Some suppressed smirks. It was the Amanda and Finn show for all to see, including Charlene, who looked away. Finn's the only one of us that can all clear with any consistency, said Charlene. I know, Amanda said. I've seen him do it. With Greg Lewowski, Finn recalled. He'd suckered Lewowski into taking a swing at him while Finn was briefly transformed into his hologram. No one had explained the science behind how Finn was able to briefly transform himself into pure light, what he and the others called all clear, he supposed it made him part fairly, like Jess and Amanda. He supposed that all clear was a state where mystical, metaphysical elements met the physical sciences. It worked two ways. Finn, as a mortal boy, could on occasion concentrate to where he suddenly turned into a hologram. It only lasted a short amount of time. His record was 18 seconds. But in that state, he could walk through walls or take a punch because technically he didn't exist as anything but light. The second way was more difficult for parents and even Wayne to understand. A hologram was nothing but light. 
When projected or crossed over into the parks as DHIs, the kids were technically nothing but light. But fear removed their state of purity. If, as a DHI, one of them became afraid, that hologram lost a percentage of data, depending on the level of fear. That resulted in a DHI that was part mortal, part teenager, part hologram, and therefore vulnerable to being wounded or captured. Finn had perfected a kind of visualization, a train coming at him from down a dark tunnel that helped him achieve all clear, pushed him into that state of invulnerable light. It was a useful, even necessary tool, and one he'd been coaching the others to learn how to do. And while you two are out playing games, what are we supposed to do? Maybeck asked, clearly complaining. I'm not hanging here. I'm not big on churches. You'll divide into groups, split up between Norway and Mexico on either side of us, said Finn. You watch for crash test dummies. Text me if you see any. Charlene and I will do the Kim Possible quest and let you know what we find out. Amanda and Jess, stay with us to make us a bigger group. That way, it's less likely we get spotted as keepers. Maybeck said, You look so stupid, Whitman. So I've heard. At least he tried for some kind of disguise, Willis said. Philby said, It's a good plan. Let's get going. Philby and Willa headed for China. After more discussion, Maybeck went by himself into Mexico. An announcement filled the loudspeakers. The fireworks were set to begin. A wooden cart sat tucked into a dark corner of the terraced path between Norway and Mexico, pushed against an island of trees and bushes. The cast member attending the unmarked cart wore a Kim Possible Adventure T-shirt. Finn, Charlene, and the sisters approached the overweight man, waiting for a small boy and his father to return their Kim Possible phone. W sent us, Finn told the cast member. Okay. The man had a gruff voice, unexpected of a cast member. We're here to do the adventure, Charlene said. I was told you would have two initials for me, he said to Finn. This had Wayne's DNA all over it. K.K. Can't be too careful, the guy said. He rifled through some phones in the cart's drawer and handed one to Finn. He launched into a memorized explanation of the game. Finn and the other three listened intently. Didn't miss a thing. Any questions? I think we've got it, Finn said, checking with his friends. Off you go. Return it here, please. I'd tell you to enjoy yourselves, but I'm not sure that's appropriate. The phone screen told Finn to step away from the cart and to press OK. The crowds for the fireworks clogged the pathway encircling the lake 40 people deep. The park music charged the air with excitement. Finn pressed OK. The cartoon image on the screen of Kim Possible changed to a photograph of a tree. A written message read, Go to this tree by the bakery cafe and press OK. Where is it? Finn said, spinning around. There! Amanda and Charlene said at the exact same moment, both pointing. OK, but let's not advertise, Finn said. The girls lowered their arms. Once at the tree behind the cafe, Finn pushed OK. The tree began speaking. Or at least it seemed so real that Charlene jumped back. Finn felt shivers run up his arms as an old man's voice, a voice he knew to be Wayne's, spoke to them from a speaker in the shrubs designed to look like a rock. We all need a waiter now and then, said the voice. Some can get a waiter's attention faster than others. This can have disappointing results. As Finn slapped his pockets hoping to find a pen, He noticed Jess already scribbling on a piece of paper. Jess carried a pencil and paper whenever she was inside the parks. She had previously had daytime dreams or visions of the future here while awake. She came prepared. Her uncanny ability to dream about future events had earned her a place as a fairly, alongside sister Amanda. 
That power was corrupted and nearly harnessed by Maleficent, who'd put Jess under the effects of a horrible spell, which brought her together with Finn and the Keepers when Amanda had sought their help to free Jess of the spell. Now, the Keepers benefited from her unique ability. On more than one occasion, the Keepers had used a Jess diary page to see an event before it happened. They'd learned to pay strict attention to anything she sketched. The phone screen said to press back to hear the message a second time. Finn pressed the button. Jess continued writing. Got it, she said. What's that supposed to mean? Charlene asked. We keep going. You know what he's like, Finn said. The screen on the phone changed. An animated Kim Possible said, Find a friend around front. Push OK and watch what he does. Again, a photo appeared. It showed two garden gnomes and some shrubs. They located the identical setting just inside the Norway plaza, past the stave church. Finn pressed OK. The gnome spun around, his backside facing them. Finn pressed OK, and the garden sculpture pivoted to face them again. He triggered the phone to repeat the effect. Whoa! Charlene exclaimed. Way cool! Please write it down, Finn said to Jess. Charlene leaned against him from one side, Amanda the other. A Finn sandwich. A cartoon of a dorky kid appeared on screen. He said that Kim Possible had identified a signal post and that she needed their help in locating it. If the enemy saw that signal, they were told, bad things might happen. Is that supposed to be some kind of code? Charlene asked. Don't know, Finn said. But he was thinking so many questions from her. The camera offered another photograph. The four of them returned to behind the bakery. Jess, with her keen artistic eye, found the scenery that matched. She positioned them all with their backs to the bakery patio and pointed to their right where the building ended at a knot of rocks and foliage. Go ahead, Charlene said. Try it. Finn pressed OK. Nothing happened. Try again, she said. Up high, Amanda said. She knew better than to point and attract attention. One by one, the other kids saw it. A red, triangular flag popping up from behind a wrought iron lamppost each time Finn pushed back. The flag reappeared and sank. Better write it down, he said, but Jess was already on it. The Kim Possible character reappeared on the phone and told them how well they were doing and that they had one last clue to find. Another picture. Charlene spotted the location immediately. It was a rock face on the way back to the Kim Possible cart where they'd started. The screen read, Push OK to have your picture taken. I don't know about having your picture taken, Amanda said. It's telling us to do it, Charlene pointed out. We've done everything so far. Finn said softly, Maybe it's a way for Wayne to see that it's really us, that we're the ones on the adventure. That makes sense, Jess said. It should probably be just you and Charlene in the picture. Agreed, Finn said. You and Amanda keep an eye out while Charlene and I do this. His personal phone vibrated in his pocket. He read the text. It was from Maybeck. CTDs on segways headed this way. Crash test dummies, Finn said. We need to hurry. Finn texted back. Diversion needed. His phone buzzed back. No prob. He and Charlene hurried out in front of the rocks and Finn pressed OK. The cartoon character's thin voice told him to face the lake and press OK again when he was ready to have his picture taken. He had no idea what might happen. A trap door? A net falling from the trees? With everyone's attention now focused on the lake, anything could happen to them and it would go unnoticed. If it was a trap... It had been cleverly planned. He and the others had walked right into it, eyes open. His thumb hovered over the phone's OK button. He pushed OK. A bright light flashed quickly from within the bushes. Finn believed this to be part of the trick, to blind them while someone attempted to capture them. 
He bumped his shoulder against Charlene and reached down and grabbed her hand. But no one came charging toward them. Finn spotted Amanda looking back at them and immediately released Charlene's hand. Return the phone to get your photos. Press OK. Finn pressed OK and was told what a great job he'd done for the Kim Possible team. How they couldn't have done it without him. Jess and Amanda joined them. Amanda said, Did you see Maybeck? He was running through the crowd, a pair of crash test dummies after him. Did they catch him? Finn asked anxiously. She pointed. The CTDs stood well above the crowd on their segways, but they were barely moving because of all the people. Maybeck had led them past Norway and had to be way ahead of them by now. A good job of creating a diversion. Finn and the girls reached the Kim Possible cart. The cast member greeted them, have a good quest? I guess, said Finn, returning the phone. Here's your picture, the man said, pointing out the snapshot pinned to a cork board. As all three girls stepped up to see it, the cast member blocked Finn from joining them and slipped something into Finn's right hand. Slippery paper. Photos. Finn could tell by the texture. He stole a glance at the first of the photos, but slid them into the only pocket in his absurd gym pants as the cast member shook his head, suggesting Finn wasn't to share these. The image on the photo hit him hard. The evil queen, somewhere in Disney Quest. She was standing in front of four students, two girls, Greg Lewowski, and a boy wearing a striped T-shirt whose face couldn't be seen because of the queen. He'd only seen it for an instant, but there was no question in his mind of what he'd seen. The queen was talking to the four kids, and more importantly, they were listening. It hit him like a slap in the face. He had to show it to the others. He simply had to. But the cast member had warned him not to. Worse, he still didn't know what was on the second photo. He needed a minute by himself. I gotta go to the bathroom he told the girls, as they turned from the posted photo. I don't get it, Charlene said. So what if our picture was taken? What's it mean? This is yours, the cast member said. I hope you enjoyed your mission and will join us another time. Charlene accepted the photo, though unhappily. Can't you wait? She asked Finn. I don't think we should split up just now. Sticking together was his rule. Yeah, okay. I'll text the others. We'll meet at the ice cream place by the fountain. There are restrooms near there. Why meet? Why not just go home? Charlene asked. The mission is over, so we've been given all the pieces, Finn said. We need to figure out what it means while it's still fresh in our heads. But those guys are out there buzzing around looking for us, she said. Finn already had his phone out and was sending a group text. Ice cream, he said. Maybeck was the last to reach the ice cream parlor. The other kids stood at the counter. The fireworks show continued, so they owned the place. Even so, they kept their voices low between greedy bites of mint chip, cookie dough, and royal fudge. If there was one thing the keepers could agree on, it was eating vast amounts of ice cream. Finn wasn't sure the others noticed Jess sketching on a napkin as the discussion began with Maybeck's heroic description of eluding the crash test dummies. We need to figure out the Kim Possible mission, Charlene said, still edgy. Finn looked at her differently now. He'd been to the bathroom and he'd dragged Philby with him. There he'd taken out the two photos and, for the first time, taken a good look at both. That's Sally Ringwald, Finn said, naming a girl who went to Winter Park. And that's... Lewowski, said Philby, who knew about the bully. Talking to the evil queen. I don't recognize the second girl. Maybe Maybeck or Charlene knows her. What's the other photo? Philby asked, for Finn had kept it tucked below the first. Who knows if we can trust these pictures, Finn said. Are you going to show it to me or not? I just think we have to keep open minds. Come on, you know me. 
Finn peeled away the first photo, revealing the second. The photo was actually two images divided by a black line, both black and white. They appeared to be freeze-frame photographs taken from a security video. On the left, it showed Charlene entering a restroom. Time and date stamped as the night before while they'd been in Disney Quest. To the right was the evil queen entering the same doorway. Twenty seconds later, Philby said. Charlene was still in there. We don't know that, Finn said. Of course she was. Who can pee and wash her hands in less than twenty seconds? She obviously met with the evil queen, just like these other kids. Philby looked back and forth between the various shots. The question is not whether she saw the queen. The question is, why haven't we been told about it? We can't jump to conclusions. Who's jumping? Philby said. Number one, she's been acting weird. Do you deny that? No, Finn said unhappily. Number two, she's been asking a ton of questions, just like a spy would. I know. Number three, she volunteered to do the Kim Possible thing with you. Now, I'm not saying she doesn't volunteer to do stuff with us, but when she does, it's always, I mean always, something physical. Something gymnastic or athletic. That's her talent. It's not to solve a mystery. That's Willa's turf. Yeah, Finn said. She was in the bathroom with the evil queen. Yeah... Finn agreed reluctantly. Why? Philby said. It was after that that she got weird. Yes, it was, Philby said. You're right. So another way to look at this is that the Queen met with her, not the other way around. Meaning, she cast a spell on Charlene. To spy on us. Maybe on the other four, too. Luowski and everyone. Maybe. Finn wasn't easily convinced that Greg Luowski could be a victim. So Charlene starts asking all these questions and acting weird. It makes sense, Finn said. So we've got to break the spell, Philby said. Ten times out of ten, when it comes to breaking a spell put onto a girl, you break it by kissing her. Not me, Finn said. If I kiss Charlene, I am not doing that. Amanda. Yes. Yeah, well, I don't exactly want Willa to see me do it. You and Willa? This is news to you? Said Philby. Finn shrugged. That just confirms what Willa says, that boys don't get any of this stuff. What stuff? You see? Philby said. His eyes shifted left and right. Maybeck, they both said at once. Back in the ice cream parlor, Finn saw Philby pull Maybeck aside and whisper to him. Maybeck's face crunched like a crushed paper bag. First, Finn said to the girls, in part to keep them from noticing Philby's whispering, was the waiter. Jess read from her notes. We all need a waiter now and then. Some can get a waiter's attention faster than others. This can have disappointing results. Then the garden gnome, Finn said. The gnome turned around, Jess said. Then turned around again to face us. At this point, Maybeck and Philby joined the group again. Maybeck flashed Finn a look impossible to interpret. Was he going to kiss Charlene or not? Finn couldn't tell. Then the flag, Amanda said. A red triangular flag, Jess added. And then the photograph, Charlene said. But what's any of it mean? The girls all looked to Philby. As to the first, Philby said, there aren't any waiters at the Norway bakery. It's a cafeteria with outside seating. We didn't look inside, Charlene admitted. Maybe we should have. Waiters deliver menus, food, and drinks, Professor Philby said, breaking the clue into smaller pieces. Philby was more like a college student than a freshman in high school. 
What else? They take stuff away after we're through. The bakery sells all sorts of stuff, Maybeck said. Meals, desserts, drinks. Just desserts, Willa said. A brainiac like Philby, Willa understood language the way he understood anything technical. What if it's a play on words? Wayne does that kind of thing. Just desserts is with one S. It means giving people what they deserve. Maybe the clue has something to do with giving the overtakers what they deserve. That's way too random, even for Wayne, said Maybeck. Heads nodded in agreement. But a play on words isn't, Philby said, sticking up for Willa. When I was washing my hands just now, you know those signs telling employees to wash their hands? Well, some wise guy had crossed out cast members and had written servers. It's not waiter, but server, Philby said. We all need a server now and then. It's server, not waiter. We all need a server now and then. Some can get a server's attention faster than others. It's a computer server. That works, said Willa. Wayne knows I've messed with the DHI server before, Philby said. Amanda said, so the full translation would be, we all need a DHI server now and then. Yes, said Philby. You guys and who else? Amanda asked. The OTs, Maybeck said. He looked cruelly at Charlene. Finn thought he was the only one to pick up on it. Willa said, And the gnome turning around like that? Jess read from her notes. The exact mission was to find a friend around front. A friend spinning around? Charlene asked. Not spinning, Philby said. A friend turning his back on you. Or hers, Willa said innocently. A friend betraying you. Us, said Maybeck still fixated on Charlene. A red flag, Amanda said. The flag was red. A red flag means something you need to notice, Willa said. Something you shouldn't miss. That everyone needs a server, Philby said. And that a friend has turned his or her back on us. We've been betrayed? Willa gasped. Charlene said to Maybeck, Quit staring at me. Why are you doing that? Finn caught himself holding his breath. Maybeck and his big mouth could ruin it all now. Finn caught a look from Philby. He was thinking the same thing. It's now or never. Maybeck said, I've just never seen you prettier. Willa giggled. Amanda and Jess watched intently as Charlene blushed and said, Seriously? Terry? What's with you? Maybeck took another step toward her while maintaining constant eye contact. This was Maybeck the Mouth in action, the self proclaimed chick magnet trying to prove himself. I don't know if it's the lighting, he said, but you look like an angel, like a movie star, like one of those girls on the front of a magazine. The it girl, the girl everyone wants to be, the prettiest, smartest girl in the room. Terry? Charlene said again, her voice quavering. He was a single step away from her now as he stopped. One memory, he said, is all I ask. He reached up and cupped her head in his hand, his thumb stroking her ear. She tilted her head slightly toward his hand. Her eyes looked sad and happy at the same time. Charlene, her voice strong once again, said, I mean, come on! She pushed Maybeck back with both hands. You really think that stuff will work on me? The other girls erupted in nervous laughter. For a moment, they'd seemed so close to a kiss. Amanda was blushing. Jess returned to her sketching, her head down, giggling. Finn could see it was a face she was drawing, an upside-down face, of a boy or a man. She hadn't put on the finishing touches yet. 
He couldn't be sure, but in the back of his mind, a small voice asked, Who? It was the keeper's policy to leave their phones on at night. Parents rarely approved of that policy, and so each of the kids had come up with his or her way to get around the objections. Finn put his into vibrate mode and left it on his side table on a piece of aluminum foil so that if it vibrated, the aluminum foil would rattle enough to wake him. He was a heavy sleeper. He didn't know what tricks the other keepers had come up with, only that if called at night, they answered. He answered his on the fourth metallic buzz as the vibrations lifted the phone and carried it close to the end table's edge and a possible tumble to the floor. What? He whispered into the phone, having already seen Philby's photo and name on its screen. Problems. Only Philby could sound like a male librarian at 1 a.m. Finn rubbed his eyes with his free hand, crunched his pillow behind him, and sat up in bed. This had better be good. I know you hate technical explanations, so I'm not sure where to start. Maybe start with the problems. I monitor bandwidth usage, as you know. The same thing Wanda did, but I don't go hacking internet hubs. The DHI server, our DHI server. All it takes is the ISP, and... You're right, forget as much of the technical stuff as possible. Philby cleared his throat. Let's put it this way. Because I have the port address to the DHI server now, I'm able to direct what park we land in when we go to sleep. You and I can go to the Magic Kingdom while Willa and Maybeck go to Animal Kingdom. The only catch is the return. We have to be together for the return. You woke me up for a history lesson? I know all this. Finn, I woke you up because we had a spike in traffic volume about ten minutes ago. My laptop wakes on network usage. I have it alarmed. I got woken up by that traffic surge. It was a major hit. A DHI, for sure. I thought you controlled that, Finn said. I thought we only crossed over when you wanted us to. I don't get it. Exactly. I do. But if Wayne or another Imagineer wanted us over there, then that's what would happen. Wayne? You think it's Wayne? I didn't know what to think, so I called you. It's Charlene, Finn. The graphic tag, the hologram's ID is Charlene's. For Finn, it was almost as if her name was echoing over the telephone line. In fact, it was nothing but a little bit of static. It would have to be her, right? He said sarcastically. The evil queen? Wayne's Kim Possible thing warned us about the server. What if the OTs have control of our server? Finn didn't answer, his heart racing. Only Philby would understand if that was possible. I wanted to follow her in there. She's in Epcot. But I didn't want to pull a Maybeck and go alone and wander into a trap. Maybeck's DHI had once followed a girl around inside the Magic Kingdom, only to go missing. He had never showed up for the return. And the others had crossed back without him. This had left his hologram stuck in the park and a sleeping Terry Maybeck in a kind of coma in his bedroom. Until his hologram was returned, the boy had not awakened. The kids now referred to this comatose state in several ways. The Sleeping Beauty Syndrome, SBS, or The Syndrome. Following Maybeck's mishap, they had instituted the buddy rule. Philby was simply playing by the rules. Can you help us get there? Of course. I'll need to send the others a text in case something goes wrong. You and I cross over, find her, and return. And if we don't return, they'll need Wanda's or Wayne's help to come looking for us. Put that in the text. Okay, Finn said. So I hang up and get back to sleep, and I'll see you in Epcot? True story. Finn ended the call, sent the group text, and slipped quietly out of bed. He had secretly oiled the hinges on both his closet and bathroom doors so they could be worked in the middle of the night without screeching. The dresser drawers were a little more tricky, so he took his time with them. Fresh socks, fresh underwear. 
He dressed quietly and quickly. Black jeans, black t-shirt with a pirate skull on the back. A brown hoodie. An old pair of running shoes he'd painted black. He pocketed his phone and wallet, which held a few dollars. Sometimes the phone worked when he crossed over. Sometimes not. He crawled back into bed and did his best to settle down knowing that Philby would have already programmed the DHI server to cross them over into Epcot. He blamed Charlene's crossing over on the evil queen. It seemed more and more likely that she had put a spell on Charlene. Maybeck's failing to kiss her loomed large. The more he thought about everything, the harder it was to get to sleep. He cleared his mind, picturing a dark tunnel with a faint pinprick of light far, far at the end the same technique he used to go all clear. He watched the pinprick widen ever so slowly, focused on that tiny speck of light in the sea of black as it grew larger, the train approaching. And then there was nothing. Finn awoke near the fountain in Epcot Central Plaza. The fountains were shut off. In fact, the entire park was lit by maybe half the available street lamps. The landing, or arrival zone, for their DHIs was one of the biggest problems with the program. Philby could now control which park each of the kids landed in, who among them would cross over, and in a pinch, he could manually return them from his home computer. But the program transmitted the DHI into a park's central feature. In the Magic Kingdom, it was the central hub in front of Cinderella Castle. In Animal Kingdom, the island and the Tree of Life. In Disney's Hollywood Studios, it was the elevated area beneath Mickey's sorcerer's hat. Here in Epcot, it was the Fountain Plaza, just beyond Spaceship Earth. In all cases, in all places, it meant their holograms landed in open space. Finn's limbs tingled as he scrambled across the plaza, reminding him that he was in his DHI state. Epcot, after closing, was not the remarkable and enchanting park it was during its opening hours. It was known to the keepers as a haven for overtakers. Crash test dummies on segways. Gigabyte, a ginormous snake that was part of Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, slithered in search of unwanted visitors. There were court jesters in France capable of every kind of martial art. There had been a time when Finn had been certain the Magic Kingdom was the overtaker's headquarters. But he was no longer so convinced. Over here, came a harsh whisper. Philby. Fifteen feet toward the lake from Finn, sitting on the walkway with his back against the information booth that housed a pin exchange. A pair of CTDs passed by here maybe five minutes ago. Finn lay down flat and kept very still. The robotic crash test dummies were nothing to mess with. How do you want to do this? he asked Philby. It's too big to just start searching around. It would take us days, not hours, to look everywhere. Then, you know me, technology. Meaning? The Illuminations control booth on the roof of Mexico. I know for a fact that setup includes feeds for all of the park's security cameras. We climb to the top of the temple. As DHIs, we should be able to walk through the door. If I get freaked out and lose all clear, then you go through and unlock it for me. We use the security monitors to find Charlene. Fifteen minutes later, Philby was sitting in a chair working switches. The television monitor displayed four camera views at a time. Heck of a view, Finn said. Outside the window, Finn had a clear view of the lake and the surrounding pavilions. He grabbed a pair of binoculars and began sweeping the area. True story. Philby allowed enough time to study the view from each security camera. Then he pushed a button and another four appeared. There were 32 camera views available. Twice, Philby spotted CTDs on the move, but no Charlene. Finn confirmed the CTDs through the binoculars. They began working out a system. With the binoculars held to his eyes, Finn said, What do you suppose they want with her? A download, Philby answered. Let's say she was put under a spell to spy on us, as we talked about. She asks questions. She looks over our shoulders. Then the evil queen and Cruella need a chance to download whatever she's found out. But she's not a zombie. Exactly. 
so who knows what state she was in when she crossed over. The CTDs could be looking for her. The Queen may need a stronger spell to get Charlene to talk. I'm just guessing at all this. It makes sense. Thank you. Movement, Finn said loudly. In front of Morocco, a pair of CTDs running. Through the binoculars, he watched the dummies in full sprint. They were tall, powerful, and surprisingly light on their feet. A trash can rolled toward them. The first vaulted it. The second bent and knocked it out of the way like it was made of cardboard. Each dummy had the strength and speed of three men. Someone threw a trash can in their way, Finn announced. Philby worked the camera views. It's her! It's Charlene! Finn had trouble finding her in the binoculars. He turned and watched on screen as Charlene ran past Norway. Philby pointed out another camera view. Charlene, wearing a white nightgown, ducked behind Norway, then cut back through the bakery patio to another camera view, the Norway courtyard. She hid as the CTDs ran past like something out of the Terminator. Then she turned to her left, scrambled up some rock, and disappeared into a dark cave. Maelstrom, Philby said. Finn had failed to recognize the cave because there was no water coming from the ride's waterfall. Smart. That's a great place to hide. Let's go, Philby said. I'll go, Finn said, volunteering. You stay and watch for the CTDs. No, Philby said. We stick together. Finn wasn't going to waste time arguing. A few minutes later, the boys were climbing Maelstrom's dry waterfall toward the ominous black cave entrance. The lip of the cave was moss-covered and slimy. There was water in the trough just beyond, so they kept to the left where a narrow ledge followed the water course. The deeper they penetrated into the ride, the darker it became. The boys used hand signals to communicate. Philby indicated for Finn to keep his eyes open. Finn had no problem with that. His heart was about to burst in his chest. As their eyes adjusted to the limited light, the maelstrom world enveloped them. Lush green bushes and trees, rocks and stones. Strange things happened inside the rides and attractions in the parks at night. The only rule was that there were no rules. Trust nothing, Finn reminded himself. On Philby's signal, both boys stopped and crouched. They saw a pair of yellow glowing eyes, tightly set. Trolls? Finn pushed past Philby and continued along the ledge. Philby followed him as they pressed deeper into the darkness. The only light coming from the faint glow of their DHIs. Not trolls, he realized. But polar bears. Two giant white bears, one standing, one down on all fours. If those things come alive, Finn said, his voice shaking. We're hamburger, Philby said, finishing the thought for him. Thanks for that image, Finn said. No charge. Morbid humor had a way of sneaking into their conversations at the strangest times. They moved past the polar bears. There was something large and squarish up ahead to their left. Finn knew where they were. The cottage, he said. The start of the ride. Finn's eyes had adjusted to where he could now see a life-sized Norwegian standing in front of a cottage. Finn hurried over to a rock that was familiar to him from his last visit here as a DHI. He reached down and felt for the three handles he knew to be there. There's an axe missing, Finn whispered. Philby stepped forward. Leaning against the rock was an old-fashioned axe and a sword. There should have been two axes. It's her, Philby said. That's why she came in here. Finn took up the sword, knowing it well from a previous visit. He handed the remaining axe to Philby. What would you have done? said Charlene's voice. They both looked up as she stepped out of the cottage, the axe gripped in her hand. They hurried over to her. 
It is you, Finn said. They hugged. You're okay, crowed Philby, also hugging her. Not really. Terrified's more like it, she addressed Philby. Why did you send me here without telling me? It wasn't me, Philby said. It wasn't like that. We can explain. We think, said Finn. But first, we've got to return. We've got to get you out of here. There are CTDs out there, she warned. We saw, Finn said. We'll have to be careful, Philby said. And if that fails, he raised his axe. A whizzing sound sizzled past Finn's ear. A chopstick lodged in the painted styrofoam scenery behind them. The next one flew through his shoulder, his pure DHI state preventing it from wounding him. Incoming, he said. He felt his own terror beginning to take hold, his fingers tingling, and understood the mortal danger it presented. No fear, he reminded. Easier said than done, Charlene cried out. Yellow eyes glowed from across the stream. More arrows whizzed past. I can feel my hands, Philby said. Me too, Charlene said. And my feet. They weren't in a state of pure DHI, which made them vulnerable to attack. Philby and Charlene ducked behind the small rocks. Eight trolls, knee-high old men with beards, whiskers, and huge eyes, appeared across the water. They carried kitchen pot lids as shields, steak knives as swords, carpentry hammers, and the homemade bows and arrows. They jumped across the water and charged. The kids stayed behind the rocks. The trolls split up. Philby took an arrow in the arm and screamed as he pulled it out. That thing hurts, he cried. A troll came at Finn, his steak knife glinting. Finn swung the sword and knocked the knife out of the troll's hand. Philby stood and pressed his back to Finn's so they could defend in two directions. Charlene, on her knees, battled axe against hammer. One of the old men surprised Finn from the right, stabbing him, but his sword passed right through Finn's hologram. The guy fell off balance. Philby kicked him across the water into the scenery. Sokka! Philby shouted to Charlene. She stood and kicked out at the trolls, sending them flying. Go! Philby cried as one of the trolls flew through the door of the cottage. That's it, Finn said. We get them all into the cottage and trap them. Philby kicked one of the trolls, passing him to Charlene like a soccer ball. She expertly sent him through the cottage door. Finn battled with his sword. He heard Philby counting them down. Four. Five. Finn's blade clanked against the steak knife of a competent swordsman. Philby came to his aid, toe-kicking the troll toward the cottage, where Charlene finished him off by sending him inside. Six. I sent one across the water, Finn said. So that's seven. The final troll dropped his hammer and threw up his arms in surrender. Philby grabbed his hands, threw him into the cottage, and Charlene shut the door. She used her axe handle to prop it shut. The kids, out of breath, looked around for more trouble, but saw none. That was... weird, Philby said. You okay? Charlene asked. Philby approached her and kissed her on the lips before she knew what he was doing. The kiss went on longer than Finn would have expected. Charlene and Philby pulled themselves apart breathlessly. What was that? Charlene asked, not a twinge of complaint in her voice. How do you feel? Finn asked. That's a stupid question, she said. Besides, that's for Philby to ask, not you. Philby looked tranquilized. I, that was, it was. He had to do it, Finn said. Excuse me, Charlene said. How would they know if she'd been put under a spell? 
Worse, how would they know if she'd come out of it? Do you remember going into the girls' room at Disney Quest? Fan asked. What kind of question is that? One that needs answering. He wished Philby would say something, but he remained stunned and unable to speak. He was staring at Charlene like he'd gotten religion. It's none of your business. Ew. Philby finally managed to speak. It is our business. Do you remember who followed you inside the girls' room? She looked frightened. Her hologram's blue outline faded. What are you two talking about? She blinked furiously, as if about to cry. Do you remember going into the bathroom at Disney Quest? Philby asked, repeating Finn's question. Yeah, I suppose. Do you remember anyone else in there with you? Like who? Amanda? Willa? Who do you mean? We were all there that night. Anyone else? Philby asked. The trolls were pounding on the door to the cottage to get out. Finn could barely hear himself think. How could you possibly know about this? Charlene asked. Know about what? Finn said. About... When I was in there, I kind of lost track of time. What do you mean? Philby asked. I mean I lost track of time. I spaced out or something. This girl was standing behind me asking if I was all right. Because? Because, according to her, I was just standing there staring into the mirror, not moving or anything. She said it was awkward, was her exact word. But how could you possibly know that? And the girl? Philby said. The one in the bathroom. Had you thought about her before just now? Before we started asking questions? Charlene shook her head. What's going on? We can explain later, Finn said. You'll explain now, she demanded. Later, Finn repeated. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me what's going on. She crossed her arms tightly. Philby was not pleased, he said. We think the evil queen may have enchanted you. To spy on us. The Keepers, Finn said, that she crossed you over tonight, because I definitely did not, Philby added. That the CTDs are out there looking for you, Finn said. That we've got to get to the return and get you out of here. Stunned, Charlene took a moment to process everything. You'll explain it all later. Yes, Finn said. I kissed you to break the spell, Philby explained. It apparently worked. You remember stuff you didn't remember before. Why? Charlene gasped. Why me? What does she want? If we're right about them trying to break Maleficent out of jail, then who knows what they want? Who knows what they think we have? But we can't get caught. We're not going to let her get you again. I want to go home, Charlene said. Makes three of us, said Finn. We can't take the axes with us, Philby said. They won't return with us. And to leave them lying around the plaza would just tell somebody that we'd been here. We don't need to leave clues like that. How about leaving seven trolls locked up in the cottage? That's their problem, Philby said. They leaned Philby's axe and Finn's sword against the rock as they'd found them. Then they hurried to the cave entrance and climbed down the dry waterfall. They stayed in shadow, using trash cans, kiosks, trees, and anything else available to hide behind. They passed Mexico and followed a perimeter route that took them near Test Track. A hundred yards from the plaza fountain, Philby stopped. Slow in now, Philby said, taking a moment to catch his breath. Extra careful. They circled around the fountain, finally reaching the pin trading station. A small, circular, one-story building, it held a large display screen that, when operating, informed guests of wait times for the various attractions. There was only one return, one black fob, capable of wirelessly connecting to the server and canceling the DHI projection. 
Finn had once asked Wayne for more of the devices, one for each park. But Wayne had steadfastly refused, explaining that the act of returning was the most dangerous part of the program. If two returns were engaged within a few seconds of each other, they would theoretically cancel each other out, and the Imagineers had no idea where that would leave the DHIs, nor the kids who lay asleep in bed. If trapped between the two worlds, the results could be devastating. The system would tolerate only one fob, one return. The keepers were currently hiding the all-important fob in Epcot, in an intersection of purple pipes that supported the roof of the pin trading post on the plaza. The pipes came together about head height, connecting with a single support column that rose up from the plaza. Where the pipes joined was a hidden space just big enough for the return. Finn reached up, his fingers searching blindly, and came down with it, a black rubber remote like a car door opener. Ready? he asked. Charlene nodded and reached for Finn's hand. Philby took her other hand, connecting them all. For the return to work effectively, they had to stand near each other. Physical contact, like holding hands, worked even better. We'll text in the morning, Philby said, and figure all this stuff out. Like what to do next. Like if there's some way to stop them from crossing us over. Like why they chose me, Charlene said. Finn stretched on his tiptoes, holding the return over the junction of pipes. As they crossed back, the return would fall from his fingers, lodging in its hiding place. They would need to know where to find it the next time they crossed over. With the three of them all holding hands, Fenn counted down. Three, two, he pushed the button. Three. Being back at school was a major letdown. A regular part of almost every day, it was still the forgettable part. His time as a keeper dominated Fenn's thoughts. The one bright spot in the school day was, of all things, lunch. Not that the food was edible. It was not. But lunchtime was Finn's chance to hang with Amanda. He stopped in the boys' room to make sure he didn't have something stuck in his teeth or a booger lodged up his nose. When his eyes shifted focus in the mirror, he saw Greg Lewowski standing behind him. Hey, Greg. Finn was mindful of the security photograph showing the evil queen talking to Lewowski and three other kids. He was a bundle of nerves, especially because Luowski didn't say anything. There was something different about Luowski's sneer. Maybe it was seeing his ugly mug reversed by the mirror. Maybe it was his piggish eyes or greasy skin. Or maybe it was just Luowski trying so hard to look menacing. It was working. If they'd given grades for imparting terror, Luowski would have gotten an A. Finn cupped his hands beneath the faucet, filled his mouth with water, and swished it around in his teeth to get rid of any cereal that might be lingering from breakfast. He did this in part to pretend that Luwowski's presence didn't concern him, in part because his hands were shaking and he didn't want Luwowski to see the effect he could have over him. When Finn stood up and looked in the mirror, Luwowski was gone. The door to the boys' room hissed shut, and Finn let out a sigh of relief. But he also wondered why Luwowski had passed up the opportunity to bully him. The silent treatment was not lousy Luwowski's style. Finn looked around to see if a teacher had entered, looked for some explanation. As far as he could tell, he was alone. He tried to let it go, to forget about it. But Luwowski had gotten under his skin. He felt slightly sick, edgy, jumpy. His skin was crawling. Amanda was sitting off by herself in the lunchroom, a hopeful look in her eyes, which brightened as she spotted him. Her tray held salad, a bowl of fruit, and a glass of water. The lettuce was mostly white, not green. The fruit, canned. Even the water looked gray through the scratched plastic cup. He arrived with a yellowish mass on his plate that had been labeled creamed chicken and rice. With enough salt, it could be swallowed. Have you seen Greg the Gross? 
he asked. Yes, you may join me, she said, ignoring his question completely. Lousy Lewowski, he said. I'd be happy to have you. Finn sat across from her. He stabbed at the yellow mound. It lives, he said, putting his fork beneath the mass and causing it to wiggle. She laughed. In the hall earlier, she said, finally answering him. His usual oafish self. She looked pretty today, like every other day. Did he look... different? A few more zits, she asked. A few less brain cells? Some creamed chicken and rice caught in Finn's throat. He washed it down with warm milk. She stabbed her fruit. The consistency of rubber, it resisted her fork, like she was trying to stab an eraser. I'm not exactly a fan, she said. I don't usually pay attention to him. She had trouble chewing her fruit. She said, but did you happen to notice Sally Ringwald's new contacts? Might have missed that. He sat up taller and listened carefully. Sally Ringwald had been one of the kids with the queen in Disney Quest. Pigmented, you know? Green. You can't believe the difference. She's much prettier now. Kind of Irish looking. One of my mom's friends wears the blue ones. It's really disturbing. It's like I'm not supposed to notice or something. I'm supposed to pretend her eyes always looked like that. As if. He paused. Don't ever do anything like that, okay? Don't go changing yourself like that. She blushed and returned to stabbing her fruit, or trying to. Where did that come from, he said. I don't mind. In a desperate effort to change subjects, he blurted out, Philby and I crossed over into Epcot last night to rescue Charlene. Rescue? To help her return. Did she ask you to? No, it's just that Philby... He hadn't arranged for her to cross over in the first place. So you're the DHI police now? Is that it? Ouch! She can't cross over without Philby's permission? What about Wayne? Or maybe the Imagineers? What if they crossed her over? It... He didn't have a great answer for that. As it turned out, it was a good thing we went in after her. We ended up battling some trolls. The CTDs were out everywhere, probably looking for her. Probably, she said, stinging him. Should he tell her? You can tell me, she said. How come girls could read his thoughts like that? He never had a clue what a girl was thinking. We think she was under a spell, he lowered his voice. The evil queen. Seriously? He reached into his back pocket. He only changed his pants about every four days and passed her the time-stamped photograph of Charlene and the evil queen entering the Disney Quest washroom. He said, There were two photographs last night, the one of the queen with Lewowski and Sally Ringwald, and this one. Notice the times. You kept this one from us? She sounded upset. We kept it from Charlene, yeah. Finn ate some more of the yellowish mush, but bit down on Gristle and pushed his tray aside. He said, She has no memory of the queen being in the girls' room with her. Amanda's concern carved lines across her face. Maybe the plan, Finn said, is to cross one of us over each night until we're all stuck in the syndrome. That would get us out of the way. If that ever happened, she said, Jess and I would cross over and come find you. The OTs can't possibly know that you made it so we can be DHIs. He spotted Sally Ringwald across the cafeteria. She was too far away for him to see her green contacts, but it prompted him to reconsider his encounter with Lewowski. What if they were green, he said. What if what were green? Lewowski. What about him? His eyes, contact lenses, he said. What if Lewowski looked different to me because his eyes were green? That's ridiculous. Greg Lewowski has boring eyes, she said. Hazel, red hair, hazel eyes. Finn said, 
But what if his boring hazel eyes are now green like Sally Ringwald's? Greg Lewowski wearing pigmented contacts? Not possible. A guy like him never thinks about how he looks. But we should think about it, Finn said, persisting. The Evil Queen corners Sally, Luowski, and a couple of others at Disney Quest. Then, a day later, they both show up at school wearing green contacts. It's like those goth groups, right? Green as in Maleficent? Get it? You're sick. It's not me, it's them. It's your idea. We've got to look for others. And you have to get close enough to Luowski to see if I'm right. Why me? She said. Because if he sees me, he goes on the Anderthal. He didn't when you were in the bathroom. Just do it, please. He's right over there by the drinks. Okay. I'll walk by him on my way out. What are you doing after school? He asked. Jess and I were grounded by Mrs. Nash. She found out about our little trip to Epcot. We're in serious trouble. It's her three-strike rule. She threatened to send us back to the Fairleys, she said. That's not going to happen. No offense, but I don't think you're going to have a lot of say in it. The school buzzer sounded. Lunch was over. See you. She stood along with half the kids in the room. She walked toward Luowski and the exit. Finn watched her every step. As she passed Luowski's table, she said something to him. Then, at the door, she turned around and found Finn. She pointed to her eyes and nodded. Her lips mouthed, green. For a second, he thought he might puke. It had nothing to do with the creamed chicken and rice. Philby felt the prickle of hairs raising on the back of his neck and knew he was being watched. Worse, he only associated that same level of dread of impending disaster with the overtakers. But in school? Normally, it wouldn't have made any sense. But the photo of students with the evil queen had changed all that for Philby. No one was to be trusted. The hallways of Edgewater High were jammed with students. Some were hurrying to class, some were flirting, some facing their lockers. But someone was watching him. He crossed past Mrs. McVeigh's classroom and stood with his back against a bulletin board filled with thumbtacked essays on the promise of electric cars. He hoped the new angle would make whoever was watching him reveal himself. But the only person he saw was Hugo Montcliffe, his neighborhood friend. Checking out the girls or what? Or what? Philby answered. He looked hard for someone focused on him. No one. We've got algebra. Yeah, so? You okay? Hugo asked. You ever get that feeling someone's watching you? Like a girl? Me? No, not so much. Do you think of anything but girls, Hugo? Xbox. The new Guerrilla Warfare 2.3. The sensation had passed. I was trying to have a little private time here, he said, wounding Hugo. For the first time, he took his eyes off the kids in the hallway and looked over at Hugo. He must have hurt him bad because Hugo didn't look like Hugo at all. Hey, Philby said. I'm sorry. Enjoy your private time, Hugo said. He charged off. Hugo! He was about to run after him when he caught a pair of eyes staring at him from across the hall. A girl with dark hair. She looked vaguely familiar, though he couldn't remember her name. The girl from the photo? She broke off the stair and moved on. Philby joined the river of students trying to catch up with her. The more he pushed, the less progress he made. He pulled to the side and tried working along the lockers. He made some headway. There! He reached out and grabbed her shoulder, turning her around. The wrong girl. Sorry! he said. Loser, the girl said, brushing his hand from her shoulder. He dragged himself out of the way of the crush. Against school rules, he pulled out his phone and sent a group text. 
We have to talk. Crazy glaze after school. Philby believed in science, empirical proof. He believed in forming a theory, developing evidence, reaching a conclusion. He lacked all of that. He had only a few hairs tickling the back of his neck and some girl who might have been staring at a hallway clock for all he knew. And yet he had no doubt, none whatsoever. There were overtakers in his school. They were watching him. It turned his world upside down. There's no place safe, he thought. Finn left school with Dillard Cole, his closest non-keeper friend and full-time neighborhood pal. Dillard was neither athletic nor particularly fit, but he had a good imagination, a huge appetite, and was probably the best gamer Finn knew. At one time, what seemed like many years ago to Finn, but wasn't actually so very long ago, the two had spent endless weekends and evenings working the thumbs, as Dillard called video gaming. Following Finn's modeling as a DHI and his recruitment into the Kingdom Keepers by Wayne, their friendship had fallen off. The reason for the fallout had been, in large part, the secrecy under which the Keepers operated. But now, with newspaper stories alleging that Finn was one of the five Kingdom Keepers, Dillard understood the complications of the past and was letting the friendship come around again. Finn found himself preoccupied with the idea of Luowski's green contact lenses. He and Amanda had blamed Charlene for their wild, near-death simulator ride in Disney Quest, but a film had been playing in Finn's memory. Luowski bumping into Charlene and helping her to pick up the virtual roller coaster tickets off the floor when she'd dropped them. What if Luowski had substituted the killer ride for the one Charlene had designed for him and Amanda? But it's over, right? Dillard said, bringing Finn back. Dillard sweated as he labored to keep up with the fast-walking Finn. You guys vanquished them. Vanquished? That is so gatecrashers, Finn said, referring to a popular video game. The Disney villains. They took care of the witch and the thing. Villains? Rumors. All rumors. So you are hurrying because... I've got to catch a city bus. I got a text from Philby, said Finn. Philby? Yeah. You two are tight. I suppose. He's a good gamer. You'd like Philby. Who'd win, do you think, at sudden disaster? Me or Philby? We'd have to find out, Finn said. What kind of dumb answer is that? My kind of dumb answer, I guess. Hey, could we slow down some? I'm soaked, said Dillard. You gotta keep up. Dillard stopped short, beads of sweat flying off him and spraying Finn, who also stopped. I could keep up if I wanted, Dillard said. I know that. I'm sorry. I can slow down if you want. Why don't you go do whatever it is you've got to do? I'll catch you later. Don't be like that. Like what? Oh, no, Finn said. Get down. He pulled Dillard to a crouch behind a parked car. Luowski? Dillard said, looking that direction. You and Luowski? I got nothing to do with that. Luowski jaywalked, crossing the street to the other side. Finn couldn't believe what he saw. Since when did Luowski give him a free pass? He's following me, Finn said. Like spying? Yeah, like that. Why? Finn thought back to the confrontation in the boys' room before lunch. He thought back to the photograph with the evil queen. It's involved, he answered. The question is, do I dare test it? Test as in... I'm going to go over there, Finn said. If he beats up on me, I may need you to rescue me. Me? And Greg Lewowski? Right. Finn handed him his phone. Threaten to call 911. Seriously? I'm not saying to do it. Just threaten it. Lewowski's stupid, but he's not dumb. He won't want to mess with the police.
He might want to mess with me, Dillard said. It's your call, Finn said. Yeah, okay, I'll do it, Finn patted him on the shoulder. Thanks. Finn stood and hurried across the street. Greg, he called out. Luowski appeared to panic. He spun around, then reconsidered and turned back to face Finn. He seemed uncharacteristically perplexed. Witless. Luowski had been born mean. He was the kind of kid destined to be a serial killer. The kind of kid who burned down garages. Who dropped rocks off highway overpasses. The kind of kid who deserved a go-directly-to-jail card in Monopoly. Are you following me? Finn said. As if. He was a bad liar. Luowski turned his head slightly, and Finn saw the green contact lenses. Instead of looking silly, they gave him a chill. Was it possible Luowski and other students, how many he had no way of knowing, had been put under a spell by the evil queen? That the green contacts were a way for them to identify each other and to intimidate the keepers? How many had the queen recruited? Did the spread of the overtakers extend beyond their own school? If so, how many did the OTs now control, and why? It was enough to make Finn wonder why he'd so eagerly crossed the street to confront Luowski in the first place. You don't get it, do you? Luowski asked. Apparently not. But something tells me I'm about to, Finn thought. The trouble with you, Witless, is you think you're so special. You and your friends. There were times that Luowski tried to act tough. Then there were times when he looked like a light bulb screwed into the socket wrong. A sparking, problem-ridden, butch-cut ex-marine in a 16-year-old's body. Finn warned himself to settle down. If he could manage a few seconds of all clear, Luowski wouldn't be able to hurt him. But at the moment, the space between him and all clear was about as wide as the Grand Canyon. Luowski was like a force field, and Finn a metal particle nearby. Worse, Luowski was relaxed. He didn't have a care in the world. Why would you want to follow me? That's what I'm asking myself, Finn said. You're confused. You are so naive. Finn studied the green-eyed kid. A word like naive had no place coming out of his mouth. You must have had language arts today. Finn said. Take off, Luowski said, before you fall down and get hurt. What did she promise you? Don't know who you're talking about, Luowski replied. Finn decided it was worth the risk. He pulled the photo out of his back pocket. Her, he said, showing the picture of Luowski and the evil queen. You photoshopped that or something? I don't even know who that is. He sounded so convincing that Finn nearly believed him. I didn't Photoshop those contact lenses. The trouble with you, Witless, is your mouth runs like a faucet. Language arts must have been a block class today. See what I mean? Don't believe her. She'll eat you up and spit you out, Finn said. Is that right? Yes. That's right. Luowski grabbed Finn by the shoulders. His hands felt like metal clamps. Listen to me carefully, witless. His breath was sour, his voice dry and raspy. The contact lenses made his eyes look like dull eyes when close up. Like dead eyes. Some of us don't believe in magic. He pushed Finn back lifting him off his feet and sending him to the sidewalk. Luowski was strong, maybe the strongest kid in the entire high school, not just ninth grade, but it had been more than strength that had lifted Finn off his feet. I'm going to call 911, came a girlish-sounding threat from across the street. Dillard waved the phone. He shouted the warning again. Luowski glanced in that direction, unfazed. You're pathetic, he said, turning his back on Finn. And you're strong, Finn was thinking. Supernaturally strong.
Crazy Glaze was a paint-your-own pottery shop owned and operated by Maybeck's aunt and legal guardian, Bess, or Jelly, as everyone called her. They lived in the apartment above the store. He worked afternoons and Saturdays helping out. Sometimes she paid him, sometimes not, depending on how well business was doing. Finn liked the smell of the glaze and wet clay. By the time he got there, the other keepers had already arrived, though not Amanda and Jess. Jelly had given them the back room all to themselves. The door closed to the outside noise and chaos of kids doing after-school art projects. The collective mood felt highly charged with anticipation. Finn sat down and caught them up on his encounter with Luowski. Philby related his story about feeling watched. Willa and Maybeck had similar stories to tell, but neither had connected the events at their school with the overtakers until they heard Finn and Philby voice their suspicions. What does it all mean? Charlene asked. Philby spoke up. It means the evil queen has found a way to recruit kids in our schools to watch us. It means we're outnumbered, Maybeck said, and outflanked that we can't trust anyone. But the contact lenses, Charlene said. They give themselves away as OTs in training or whatever, right? I mean, why do that? Intimidation, Maybeck said. Is there some other explanation? Agreed. It's the fear factor, Finn answered. Maybe they think we can all go all clear and want us nervous and on guard to keep us from doing that. And it makes them feel special, Willa said. It makes them important and part of a bigger group. It is unusual to make your spies known to the enemy, Professor Philby said. Let's assume they're planning some kind of jailbreak. Remember, the OTs are characters. That means they're confined to the parks. And it's entirely possible Maleficent and Chernobog aren't being kept locked up in any of the parks. They could be in jail anywhere. That might make it necessary for the OTs to have field agents, people on the ground to do stuff for them. The Queen put spells on a few kids that would explain Luowski's bizarre strength and tests them out with some assignments and then moves them like pawns to do her dirty work. Finn spoke first. I hate to say it, but it makes sense. No one is going to stop Luowski with that kind of strength. If there are five or six of them like that, they could easily overpower a bunch of guards. Or us, Maybeck said ominously. Maybe when the time comes, their job is to keep us from interfering with the evil queen's plans. We've messed things up a lot for them in the past. Good point, Willa said. Oh my gosh, Charlene said. I just got it. She was fixed on Maybeck. You were trying to kiss me to bring me out of the spell, in Epcot, at ice cream. Can we stay on topic, please? Philby said. Maybeck said, you missed your big chance. How long had you guys known? About the spell, I mean, Charlene said, ignoring Philby's request. We can do this later, Philby said. The point is you're back. Jess showed me a sketch today, Willa said, changing subjects. At school, Finn recalled Jess drawing on a napkin at the ice cream parlor. And? he asked. She said it had just come to her when we were in the parks. And? Finn repeated anxiously. It was this military guy, like a general, or maybe a police officer or something. What kind of officer? Philby asked. How would I know? They all look the same to me. Just a guy, a grown-up in a uniform. I'd like to see it, Philby said, wondering if it had something to do with Wanda being locked up. According to Finn's mother, she was supposed to have been released earlier that day. Finn nodded. So you can ask Jess, Willa said. What are we supposed to do? Maybeck asked. Spy on their spies? That could be awkward. So what can we do about it? The ever-practical Willa asked. Can you stop what happened to me from happening again? Charlene asked. It shouldn't have happened to you in the first place, Philby said. That doesn't exactly answer my question, she said. Philby said, I can monitor the traffic, set a data alarm. 
If there's another surge of data, high bandwidth usage, I should be able to detect it. That doesn't exactly sound promising, Maybach said. I'm open to suggestions, said Philby, knowing he was the only one who understood any of what he'd just said. I'd like to gang up on one of these imitation flavor overtakers and have a little talk with them about what they're up to, Maybach said. I wonder how strong they are when it's three against one. I hate to say it, said Willa, but it might be better, safer, to try a girl first. Sally Ringwald, Finn said. She was in the photo with Lady Evil, and Amanda said she's now wearing green contacts. Can you or Amanda get her alone with us someplace? Maybach asked. Listen to you, Charlene said, chastising them. You're going to hurt some girl without even being sure she's part of this? Of course you'd defend her. You were working for the evil queen yourself. Besides, who said we're going to hurt her? Maybach said. Scare her a little, maybe. Sure. It's not like the OTs don't scare us, am I right? You bet I am. It's time we return the favor is all. If those guys are spies, we need to know it before it's too late. Heads nodded in agreement. I was apparently a spy for them and I didn't even know it, Charlene reminded in a somber voice. We'll keep that in mind, Maybach said, but it didn't sound as if he meant a word of it. Four. Philby's cat, Elvis, was a plump, lazy cat. The kind of plump that might get him mistaken for a pet raccoon. The kind that scared off small dogs. Elvis, like all cats, enjoyed warm places to sleep. On the couch, nestled between pillows, curled up in a shirt that had been tossed on the floor. Philby's laptop computer ran hot. Its internal fan emitted a pleasant, cat-like purr. Elvis jumped first to the empty office chair, then up to the desk and lay across the purring keyboard, luxuriating in its warmth. At desk height, he was nearly level with Philby, who slept soundly in his bed across the room. Elvis got up and circled once, unable to find the perfect position. His back paws hit several keys at once. On the screen, a window closed, then another. Elvis took no notice. He'd found the perfect spot to sleep. He had no idea that he'd just closed the data traffic monitoring program Philby used to police the DHI server. No idea he'd turned off Philby's data alarm. Instead, he settled his formidable self over the keys, wiggling until gravity claimed various parts of him. He placed his considerable cat chin down gently onto his crossed paws and closed his eyes. Behind him, the laptop timed out and went into sleep mode along with him. The boy in the bed knew no different. Willa slept with a bear. Not a real bear, a stuffed bear. But no normal stuffed bear either. A sizable bear. A gargantuan bear of proportions nearing those of a small child. She slept with it alongside of her, its head on a pillow or sometimes rocked up on its side with its black button eyes looking right at her as she drifted off to sleep. And sometimes, at the same magical moment of finding sleep, she would sling an arm around it and pull it in close, subconsciously enjoying its fuzzy fur, as well as the comfort of having something so wonderfully close. She dozed off, dreaming of school that day, of meeting the keepers at Crazy Glaze, and of a particularly disturbing exchange of texts with Philby. They'd been texting a lot recently, which she didn't mind at all. But when she found out that Philby, not Maybeck, had kissed Charlene to break the spell, she'd felt the tug of jealousy. Charlene, with her athletic ability, her incredible looks, and her Class A flirting. If she turned on the charm, a fire hydrant would agree to go to the mall with her, why had Philby been the one to kiss her and not Finn? Why had his recent texts felt more normal and less crushy? Mr. Totems brought her comfort, but her mind wouldn't stop churning. Willa's dream became intensely realistic. Suddenly, she was laying beside a lake while clutching tightly to Mr. Totems, her bear. Across the lake, rising out of the water, 
was a green dinosaur. A brontosaurus, she thought, though she was no expert. It was not daylight, but it was not exactly night, either. There was an eerie quality to the color of the light. Everything around her was glowing. She let go of Mr. Totem's, noticing the familiar shimmer to the outline of her forearm and hand. She held her hand out in front of her, admiring the translucent quality of her skin. Then a breeze blew across her, and she shivered. And she gasped. It wasn't a dream at all. She was a hologram. A DHI. She had crossed over in her sleep. It wasn't supposed to have been able to happen. They had talked about avoiding crossing over until they knew more, until they knew it was safe. Philby would have told her if he'd planned this. Otherwise, it must be an extreme emergency, she thought. Something that couldn't wait. And here she was, in her pajamas with Mr. Totems, somewhere in Disney World. At least her justice pajamas weren't too embarrassing. Red pants and a long sleeve top with a panda bear and fireworks that glittered. Not exactly what she wanted to be seen in, but better than a nightgown, which was what Charlene typically ended up in. But which park was it? Willa wondered as she took her bearings. She faced a street, not much of a clue. Some buildings surrounding an open plaza. Again, not enough to tell her which park it was. She sat on a raised platform. It was nearly pitch black above her, except that she could just make out a patch of nighttime clouds swirling directly overhead in a donut of black. Her lack of familiarity with the place told her two things. One, she wasn't anywhere in the Magic Kingdom or the Animal Kingdom. She knew both parks too well. Two, by process of elimination, that left only Epcot and Disney's Hollywood Studios. Epcot had streets in the various World Showcase attractions, but none as wide, as real-looking as what she faced. A moment later, she had it. She was sitting beneath Mickey's sorcerer's hat. Now it made so much sense, she felt stupid. Disney's Hollywood Studios, of course. She heard a rhythmic clump, 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 reminding her at first of the sound of the football team crossing the running track as they ran out onto a field before a game. The sounds rang of men and equipment. She sat up, only to realize she was clutching tightly to Mr. Totems. She held Mr. Totems to the side so she could see, and there... Coming up Sunset Boulevard was a group, no, she thought, a troop of soldiers. They were so hard to see that she thought they must be wearing camouflage. But as they drew closer, clump, 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 she saw it wasn't camouflage. They were a solid dark green. They were the army men from Toy Story. But they weren't toys at all. They were life-size, and they were coming right at her. Willa grabbed Mr. Totems and scrambled to her feet, heading away from the army men, keeping in shadow until she fled down a set of steps. She sprinted once she reached the plaza, running down Commissary Lane and putting some distance between herself and the troop. Arriving at the end of the street, she heard more of the organized marching up ahead. She turned left, passed some landscaping, and kept running. The sounds of marching soldiers all around her Forced by the sounds to move to her left, she now faced Echo Lake. Willa squeezed Mr. Totems all the tighter. This wasn't going well. To either side of the lake were more army men, enough to block her way. Behind her, the two squads arrived, now merged as one large unit. Mr. Totems, it's time to get out of here. Any suggestions? Mr. Totems didn't answer. His expression didn't change. Willa wondered if something like this had happened to Charlene the night before. Was she under some spell she didn't know about? What did they want with her? She recalled Maybeck wanting to scare the truth out of one of the green contact lens kids. She hoped that wasn't what was intended for her. If so, it was already working. She needed to get to Epcot. She needed the return. Close the ranks! came a heavily accented Frenchman's voice. Willa didn't see him at first. 
She was far more concerned with the circle of green army men tightening around her. Then she spotted him, a man in a red velvet dinner jacket, beneath which was a frilly white shirt and a bizarrely large black bow tie, the tails of which disappeared into the velvet. His pants were three-quarter length, tight around the calf and puffy on his upper legs, with hook-and-eye laced brown leather boots, spit-polished to gleaming, He had long, curly hair, a wig perhaps, beneath an exaggerated hat like those worn by the three musketeers. Judge Claude Frollo, from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It took her another few seconds to figure out what he was doing here in the studios. That he was part of the Phantasmic show. The soldiers continued to close around her. You have to understand, my dear, Judge Frollo said. I have no patience for young children. As a judge, that is. My verdict is a simple one. Guilty of having too much fun. Guilty. Misuse of time. Guilty. Irresponsible. Unacceptable behavior. Guilty. So it's nothing personal, you understand. It comes down to this. It has fallen upon me to determine what your friend showed you at school. I am told it is a drawing, and that it was drawn upon a small square tissue. He stroked his chin, a nervous habit. What is the subject matter of this drawing, if you please? But I don't... She said. Excusez-moi. If you please, she said. I don't wish to tell you. Perplexed, he cocked his head, considering her. I would be careful, my dear. My politeness is but a formality, an inescapable part of my egalitarian French upbringing. So civilized, the French, don't you think? But make no mistake, I would just as soon direct my minions here, he said, gesturing toward the hundred soldiers, to test the water as it were, to send you bottom fishing, to drown you, my dear. Did I caution you that I'm not a patient man when it comes to children? I can't tell you what I don't know, she said, lying, though lying well, she thought. But you were seen, witnessed. It was reported. Her head swooned. Which was it, witnessed or reported? One way would put the event in her school hallway, another inside the private meeting with the other keepers. The source of the leak was of vital importance to her. She thought of Philby and what he'd do in her position. Gather intelligence, she thought. Gain enough data, enough information to form an exit strategy, an escape plan. Finn would have schooled her to rely upon her DHI status to maintain all clear. But she was so scared, her teeth would have been chattering had she not been biting down on her tongue. If she were 50% DHI at the moment, she'd be lucky. The thin blue outline that should have been surrounding her arms had dimmed to nearly nothing. All clear was not an option. Not at the moment, anyway. Judge Frollo smiled, a snarl of gnarly teeth and a twist of lip that turned her stomach. If it please the court, he said, then guffawing, since he was the court, I will ask the defendant again. What did you see drawn upon the tissue? It was a napkin, your honor, she said, trying to appeal to his sense of importance. A tissue meant to catch crumbs in your lap. It is not something one writes upon. That task is better served by a pad of drawing paper or note paper. There may have been a logo or business name I was meant to take note of. I'm sorry to say, I don't happen to remember. You do, however, recall what it is I intended to do to the infant boy in the animated motion picture that bears in part the name of a certain famous Parisian cathedral? Notre Dame. The same! You were going to kill him, she said. Quasimodo, your memory is not so bad after all, I see. Excellent. Now try again. 
one last time. What was drawn upon the napkin, the crumb-catching tissue? And again, as much as I'd like, I can't describe something that wasn't there, she said, trying to speak somewhat like him, trying to befriend him. More's the pity. My lack of patience is something I must improve upon. Very well. Caesar, into the lake with her, a wet nap, a swim with the fishes, drown her! He roared, waving his hand like a ballet dancer's toward the lake. Strangely, she thought only of Mr. Totems. If they drowned her, what would it mean for Mr. Totems? Would they tear him to pieces? As much as she loathed the idea of leaving Mr. Totems behind, a plan began to form in her mind. The soldiers were about to pick her up and throw her into the lake. If, at the exact moment, she could substitute Mr. Totems for herself... She couldn't feel sorry for Mr. Totems. She had to think of it as Mr. Totems sacrificing himself for her. Maybe she could come back and get him later. Who knew? They'd come through a lot together. Bubble gum stuck in his fur, the replacement of one of his button eyes, a torn seam that left him spewing stuffing, tiny plastic balls that smelled something like fish. If she charged the line of army men, they would simply catch hold of her. No, the answer was the water itself. Give them Mr. Totems and then dive in and swim for the opposite side, hoping to beat the Claudie soldiers. With a second dismissive flick of his wrist, Judge Frollo signaled the green soldiers to close around her. Willa felt lightheaded. She held Mr. Totems tightly. Three, two, a soldier reached for her. She stuffed Mr. Totems into the soldier's open arms, pushed Judge Frollo into the others, turned, and ran five steps to the lake's edge. Shoot her! She heard. She dove. White lines raced around her, bullets zooming through the water. She couldn't surface without being shot. Down. Down she swam, pulling against the water and traveling deeper and deeper. She had thought Echo Lake was only a few feet deep, but suddenly it was much deeper. The bullets weren't reaching her now, but, as she looked up, they were zooming overhead like shooting stars. And there in silhouette was Mr. Totems floating on the lake's surface. Snow was falling all around him as bullets riddled his body. Not snow, she realized, but his stuffing. Mr. Totems had given his life for her. Willa screamed underwater, bubbles rising above her like silver Christmas balls. She was smart enough not to breathe in, to avoid inhaling a fatal lungful of lake water. But she was sinking now, her lungs aching. She felt lightheaded. Something up ahead, a dark flowing shape interrupting the light on the surface, a fish the size of a porpoise or a shark, yet even more graceful. It grew larger with its approach. Her lungs about to burst, Willa saw a flash of green, a glimpse of rust-colored seaweed. No, she realized. Not seaweed, but hair. It was a mermaid. It was Ariel. A girl's long fingers reached out for her. Willa took hold. Ariel pressed her face close to hers and blew bubbles in a steady stream into her lips. And Willa drank them in. The pain in her lungs subsided. The two swam side by side, Ariel stopping every few yards and blowing another stream of bubbles for Willa to inhale. Ariel led her across the lake, and they surfaced together on the far side of a large white ship tied up to shore. Willa sucked in the fresh air, and Ariel held a finger to her lips, silencing her. There was much shouting and yelling from Judge Frollo, and the sound of the soldiers' feet pounding the pavement as they surrounded the lake. Ariel pointed down, signaling for them to go underwater again. Willa was reluctant, but nodded her consent. Where had Ariel come from? 
Were there more characters like her willing to help the keepers? They dove. Ariel led her along the tank wall. The lake was nothing more than a giant swimming pool. Until they reached a large hole, the end of a pipe. Ariel filled Willa's lungs with air and smiled beautifully. And Willa knew it was going to be okay. Ariel swam into the opening first, and Willa followed. The pipe grew increasingly darker. Unable to see, Willa felt outward and caught Ariel's hand. Suddenly, the powerful tail propelled them. Willa had never moved so fast in the water. Twice, Ariel stopped to charge Willa's lungs in the dark. Twice, Willa drank in the air, only to feel herself whisked away into the darkness again. Ariel pulled her upward. Willa's head broke the surface. Again, she gasped for air, marveling that she was still alive. They were in a large tank with a ladder and a metal platform. She spotted a sign on the wall that read, Voyage of the Little Mermaid, Backstage Entrance. An arrow pointed to a door. Ariel focused on the door, then eased Willa toward the stairs in the water. Willa shook her head. I can't thank you enough for saving me. But if the soldiers saw us, they will come looking. They will start here, she said, pointing to the sign. I need to get to Epcot. My friends and I... The keepers? Ariel said in a beautiful, lilting voice. Willa coughed. You know about us? Ariel blinked and smiled at her. My dear girl, everyone knows about you. You are our saviors. Our saviors? What did she mean by that? Willa wondered. Are there more of you? No, no, no. We're just kids. We're nobodies. Believe me. I'm afraid no one would believe such nonsense, said Ariel. We know who you are. We are most grateful for what you are doing. We all, any of us, We'll do whatever we can to keep the magic. The magic is what feeds us. Us. There it was again. It isn't safe here, Willa said. I don't want to leave you. Please don't think me rude, but I don't want to get you in any more trouble than you're already in. You are shaking, Ariel said. I'm cold. One last swim, Ariel said. I know a place, the perfect place, warm, and I can be with you without concern. I couldn't ask that. You've done enough. It's okay, dear girl. Willa. Ah, you are the willow. Willa, she corrected. Yes, I know, of course. And Shirley. Charlene. Of course, I know. You ask nothing. It is after hours. I can go back and forth, tail or legs, as I choose. I am happy to help you. Come, please swim with me. A short distance? I promise. Willa didn't want to use that backstage door. She nodded. Ariel dove. Willa followed and grabbed her hand. Again, the water was dark. Ariel's powerful tail drove them left, right, and up, straight up. Harder and harder the tail pushed. Higher they swam. Willa didn't understand how it was possible. When they'd started, they couldn't have been more than 10 or 15 feet underground, yet now it felt as if they'd climbed 50 feet or more. Ariel had not fed her any air. Her lungs were bursting as they broke through the surface. She coughed and gasped for air. They found themselves in a much bigger tank. Again, a metal ladder ran down below the water's surface, stretching high above them to a circular catwalk surrounding the tank. As Ariel pulled herself up the rungs, Willa watched as her mermaid's tail changed into a girl's long bare legs and bare bottom. I keep these handy just for this transition, Ariel said once they'd reached a steel catwalk at the top. She had her back to Willa as she slipped on a pair of bikini bottoms that she'd had cleverly wrapped around the back strap of her halter top, hidden by her long hair. 
She led Willa out a heavy metal door and onto another catwalk. Willa nearly screamed as she reached to steady herself. They were a hundred feet above ground, high up on a catwalk balcony surrounding the park water tower. But Willa, like Philby, was a climber and had no trouble with the height once she realized where she was. Ms. Cheerleader, Charlene, could do some climbing too, but more of the gymnastic variety. Willa and Philby were the keepers who did the rope courses and climbing wall as after-school activities. It was where she'd first started liking him. It's beautiful, Willa said. Yes, I love it up here. There's a lot to be said for being human. You saved my life. Mermaids, Ariel said, interrupting, have a long-standing tradition of rescuing sailors at sea. It would seem that is about all we're good for. That and exciting homesick sailors in the first place. In my house, you're known for your singing. Yes, well, that came later. What do we do now? Asked Willa. I am not sure. I only know that no one will find us here. No one will see us. I often spend time here, overlooking the park, watching the guests playing the occasional prank. Did you know that mermaids like to make practical jokes? First, I've heard of it. Yes, well, how would you feel if shipbuilders were constantly carving sculptures of you on the front of their ships from the waist up? It's undignified. Such things deserve practical joking. Can I ask you something? Willa said. You just did. Willa giggled. You said you knew of the keepers. Of course. Are there others who would consider helping us? I told you, you have many friends here. You might be surprised to discover how many stand with you. Here in the world and in the land as well. We lack only a leader. We assume that is why you and the others have come. To lead us. Willa's head spun. Finn had often talked about Wayne making reference to leadership. She'd always thought of it in terms of the Keepers, never the Disney characters themselves. Willa had never considered that she and the others were there to lead a movement. She doubted Finn or anyone else had either. My father, King Triton, says a kingdom has room for only one ruler, Ariel said. Our group is more of a democracy, Willa said. But... Maybe we're here to help you find a leader. What about Mickey? Isn't Mickey your leader? Ariel locked into a distant stare. She'd gone somewhere far away. We can discuss this another time, I think. Her entire demeanor had changed. Willa filed the information away for later. Why had mention of Mickey closed off Ariel? Willa said, Let me ask you this. If you're here, she reached over and touched the beautiful girl. Does that mean Ursula's here too?